We are just days away from Cage Warriors 153. This is the Owl Triangle episode 30, and we have a great stacked show for you today. Paul Redzer Redmond is going to join us. We're going to take a look at the full Cage Warriors card, share our own opinions a little bit later on. Caelan Rockwin joins us ahead of his Cage Warriors 154 fight in Rome the following weekend. It's a busy, busy time for Irish MMA. We're going to talk some Premier FC. Dee Begley was in action. Palahan has a fight. Um, we're going to get into it all here. But as always, I'm joined by Andy Stevenson. And, and we're going to get took straight into Premier FC. Uh, lads, first of all, how are you? Are you well? Uh, what's the crack? And buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. I'm looking forward to it. Tell you what, fight week coming up, Cage Warriors. I'm getting excited. That's I'm it. Days excited. away now. Days away. Yeah. Days away. Look, we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Quilcher, I'm going to go straight to you. Premier FC, obviously we had Niall on in the last episode and he broke down this card. It went down last weekend um a couple of good fights on it lots of finishes um you were looking at it along with the rest of us as well just give us your thoughts on the whole card uh and and your breakdown of some of the fights like i said lots of finishes lots of talking yeah. points yeah like premier it's one of those cards now that you see you're seeing a lot of new faces that we've probably not seen on the likes of cage conflict and co and it's it's good to see them we're getting a lot of lads from I guess month the monster area getting an opportunity to compete locally as well, which makes a massive difference. But uh, yeah, it was a good card. There was a few uh, standout fights. Uh, there was yet another mad submission that we haven't seen either. I haven't seen before anyway. Um, haven't seen and or some people haven't seen in a while, I guess. But uh, another great call from uh, Paul Brown on that one as well. But we'll get into that one as we go into the card a bit further. A uh, small enough card as well. I was surprised. I think it was uh, only eight fights in the end. Um, and a few, there's a few, I think there's a few late replacements here and there. But besides that, look, really enjoyed it overall. And uh, good to see some MMA back in Cork as well, you know. Yeah, 100%. The main event was Brian Manning versus Jess Paolo. And I think, look at Jess Paolo uh, taking fights left, right and center. And he stepped in here, Quilce, on short notice as well. Uh, I think on a week's notice, up a weight class as well in the middleweight division. And uh, yeah, very, look at. Credit to him for coming in. Obviously, he didn't get the result that he wanted. Brian Manning just proved to be a little bit too strong. And um, it was a typical kind of a Jess Paolo performance where he wants to kind of come in and initiate his grappling game. And um, unlucky for him on the night, Brian Manning had all the answers and, and went on to win a split decision in a really close fight. Yeah, like it was, as you said, it was kind of a typical Jess Paolo fight. Um, I, was, I was actually really impressed with because this site, like, there is a bit of a, there's a weight difference there. He's used to competing at welterweight, and I'm pretty sure this was at 86 kg, which is 20 pounds heavier than what he's used to competing at. Um, yeah, 190, I think it was at, yeah. Yeah, so, like, that's, it's a re it was really, I was really impressed by the strength and the ability to kind of hang in there with someone who's, you know, uh, at that size when you're not used to that weight class, so, uh, and to take on short notice, but uh, you could argue that he could have won the decision, but, um split went in favor of Brian and fair play to Brian. That's a big win for him. And a lot of pressure on someone like Brian as well, who's one in three going into this and headlining uh, the card in Cork. So adds that little bit of pressure, but fair play to him. He came out of that with a big win and a nice kind of bounce run for the next one. Yeah, Andy, I know we got a close look at uh, uh, Parry Kelleher who was in the co-main event. He was back in action again against Brian Draper and, and dropped a unanimous decision in another close fight. But it's great to see Parry in there and, and competing doing, look at, I think, Talking They're to Marlene and Lee. Yeah, 44. Like, I mean, he's doing this for his passion. I mean, he's, he, he has these own expectations, I'm sure. But it's great to see him getting in there and getting the chance. And it's a good story. But he was unfortunate. He ended up on the wrong side of the fit decision against Brian Draper, who, you know, caught him and had uh, dropped him a, a, on occasion on the fight as well. And it was a good performance from Brian Draper as well. But, uh, yeah, it's good to see Parry getting in there uh, and, and competing. And, yeah, we got a good close look at him. And it'll be exciting to see what's next for him and, and yeah, like, too. yeah look fair play to him firstly and like I, I'm sure like I don't know I've never spoken to the guy but as you said 44 years old he's probably not trying to you know make it to the UFC and all this stuff who, who knows maybe he is but I but I'd be surprised if that was the case um yeah fair, fair play to him for getting in there look I think um Brian Draper just looked smoother he was quicker lighter on his feet in and out um I thought he won the fight 
for the entire nine minutes it went. Um, caught him with a big left hand, dropped him early. Um, and I, I think it was a very positive showing from uh, from Brian Draper. I think, you know, his, his corner were, were shouting a little bit to let the hands go a bit more. Um, I know he's been not the most active in recent years. He's only had a few fights in the last few years, so hopefully this can be something that he, he can build on. Um, but yeah, a, a positive showing and a quick heavyweight. Yeah, 100%. Going down the rest of the car, Quilcha, four submissions in a row. John Masek uh, got an, eye, uh, an arm triangle choke against Craig Crawley. Uh, Kai O'Brien, uh, rear naked choke against Alan Gadira. Uh, Gira Andrews got a rear naked choke over Niall Tucker. And Russ Georgie picked up the modified mirror lock over Max Garvey. And that was the submission that you were kind of alluding to at the start of the podcast. An unusual one there to kind of kick us off in the run of four submissions. Yeah, um, I honestly, I struggled to try and describe it. I was sitting there watching it back and I was listening to the commentary and everything. And I I, I was kind of taken back by the submission. It was re- it was really, really impressive. Um, had, haven't seen it before. Great call by Paul Brown to, to straight away. I think he says he's like, I think that could, that could have been a mere lock and lo and behold, it's a modified mere lock. Really impressive submission. And uh there's just something about Irish MMA and these mad submissions. We had Tirico Plata before, and now we've got a mere lock. God knows what's next, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, fair play. That was a that was a really really good submission. I was very impressed at Russ Georgia yeah. there. Like so, he, yeah, um, I was talking. I was came, talking. So had any? Oh no, I was just gonna say he's training out of Satori BJJ. I know. Um, yeah. Oh, a that's few, where Jake a few funky, funky, out, yeah. yeah, a few funky submissions coming out of that gym. Yeah, I was talking to Paul, actually. I just reached out to him before we started recording just to kind of get a further breakdown. And obviously, he did an excellent job on the time to even call it. But um, he was unsure whether it was just your your standard uh, armbar, which obviously manipulates the elbow, but the mirror lock actually manipulates the shoulder joint as well. So um, it was kind of half and half because uh, Garvey's arm kind of slid out um, I think Georgie, he had told, um, based off what Paul Brown said, shout out to Browner, um, he had said that he was going for the mirror lock, but um, the arm slid out a little bit, so it turned into a half mirror lock, half arm bar kind of it. So that's why it has been officially announced as a modified mirror lock. But uh, yeah, very unusual one, one I'd never seen as well. So I was glad to get that breakdown from Paul Brown as well to kind of further explain oh, I won't that. lie. I've been watching it about six times in a row and I'm like, I, I still don't really understand this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah, very, it's a really kind of a, a groovy one. It's a tough angle to watch it and to kind of see it back as well. But um, yeah, interesting to see. Look at any any other major standout squealcher from the card before we move on and talk about the big Cage Warriors card. Um, yeah, I guess the, there's two quick ones. Kyle O'Brien, I think he took that fight, uh, up weight class or whatever. I think that was short notice. Um, quick stuff from him. He was really impressive. He promised that he'd uh, show something good and he did. Got that back quickly and got the rear naked choke. Um, his strikes beforehand were really wet, were really good. So mixing up the kicks nicely, switching stance. So, uh, a lot of promising signs from him. Uh, the only other one that I have, I guess, would be, uh, that Jan Masik and Craig Colley fight, uh, fight. So Jan would have been, I would have seen him from the IMAFs, won national titles over in Czech Republic, quite the prospect over there. Um, I think Crowley made the mistake of pulling guard in an MMA fight. And then from there, it just, it was all downhill really. And yeah, Masek managed to get get the arm triangle stepped over in side control. And well, that was it really. And uh, yeah, it was good. It was really good submission, but there were two standouts for me personally from when I was watching the card. 100% look at this it was one of those cards that you know didn't have maybe the most common uh, known amateur fighters on it but it definitely delivered in terms of entertainment and finishes and close fights and good matchmaking as well so shout out to Premier FC and the lads for that as well um, they will be back on July 22nd so that's a new date their next one is on July 22nd it'll be back in the Talbot Hotel in Clonmel and they just announced that after the card uh, as well. So we'll be looking forward to that next installment from the Premier FC lads who are doing such a great job. Um, let's move on, lads. Let's get to um, the business end of things when we're talking Cage Warriors. One, five, three, two, three days away now. Um, before we go over to the Paul Redmond interview, we'll talk a little bit about Paul, about his retirement and stuff like that. And we go into the Cage Warriors card. So we'll kind of get that out of the way. The occasion itself, lads, Cage Warriors always 
bring a monumental card to Ireland. There's been history upon history and upon fights upon fights that have gone down under the Cage Warrior bar- banner in Ireland. Um, always create memorable moments. Most recent being the one in Belfast with Reese McKee and that barn burner of a fight with Justin Burlinson. He takes the headline slot of coming into two fight or one five three against judo Jimmy Wallhead. Um, let's not so much get into the fights, but more the occasion, Andy. Um, with Cage Warriors coming, I'm sure you're along the same vein as myself and their excitement for the card. Um, you know, there's lots of interesting stories that are happening throughout. We have Reese and his kind of arc from starting his career in the tree arena to now defending and unifying his welterweight title there against Jimmy Wallhead. A couple of guys who are making their debuts and are starting off in their career. We've got James Sheehan in title implement, impl- implications. I always mess that up. Coming in with Oban Elliott, uh, which we'll talk about, obviously, with Redger as well. But maybe your excitement for the card, the occasion. I know you're looking forward to getting there and witnessing the action uh, live uh, in media row. Um, you must be buzzing. I am. I'm absolutely buzzing for this. Um, for many, many reasons. Like I think, one, it's just great to see them back in the Republic of Ireland again. Like Obviously, it's brilliant that they're coming to Belfast, but the more shows that, that we can have in the Republic, the better uh, for the health of, of Irish MMA. And um, and yeah, like I'm sure, it, I don't know if it helps, but it legitimizes Irish MMA. Do you know what I mean? Like it legitimizes MMA, a professional organization coming to the Republic of Ireland like this. And obviously we've got Bellator, but the more come, the better, the PFLs, the Octagons, the Cage Warriors, and the, as you mentioned, the lineage and the history that we've had here. I remember going to the last time it was in the Republic down in Cork and it was, it was amazing. Like the, they blew the roof. It was, you know, it's a small venue, Neptune stadium, but it was just really, really exciting. You felt that there was a buzz. You felt that you were starting to follow fighters on their journeys. Ian Gary fought that night. Reese McKee, who will headline, uh, fought that night. Um, and, and so did a bunch of others. But, um, was it Palahan got that uppercut KO yeah. uh, as an amateur? And now he's gone on to to fight in Combate Global. So it's very, very exciting. And I think this card in particular, it has the potential to for a, a whole host of Irish fighters to springboard off it. Um, Ryan Shelley, if Ryan Shelley can go in here and beat Tobias Harilla, we're talking title uh, or, or, or right up there. At least we're talking, you know, he's in that mix. Um, he had a huge performance against Josh Reed, but to go in here against a, a wrecking ball, a uh, cold faced killer who's going to come out and, and the occasion will be huge because he has that crazy walkout. So he's kind of the perfect dance partner. You've got the Morgan Charrier, uh, obviously not Irish, but like he brings, he brings that something different to a card, the, a bit of grandeur. Um, there's just so many, there's so many fighters on this who can make their name as well. Um, so from, from every aspect, um, I'm really, really looking forward to this. I think that Irish MMA history is steeped in cage wars and vice versa. Um, and this is another chapter in it. So it's really, really important for for fighters um, who are not fighting on better tour shows twice a year to to have that opportunity here. And I think that's that's what that represents for me. 100%. And on top of everything else, Quilcha, we have the three arena, the famous three arena, uh, which has been kind of a focal point in a lot of historic moments in its own right in Irish mixed martial arts as well, obviously with the old Bama shows and obviously Bellator have been there. Now cage warriors are going to be there as well. So I think we have the two kind of a cage warriors, Irish show plus the venue. It's all accumulating into what is going to be like, I mean, it's, I, you don't want to jinx it. You don't want to put the hex on it or anything like that. But I mean, all the ingredients here with the fights that we have coming up, it, it can't un- be nothing but a really special show in the tree arena next Saturday night. Yeah, completely. It's um, it's one it's one of those events that have any Irish MMA fan excited. You've got the names that are coming up from the amateur ranks, um, have come through the amateur ranks and now making waves in cage warriors. You've got the athletes from all all, all different gyms as well. You've got them from across across the country coming to, go, uh, going to Dublin for that card, and then. It's. It just feels like it could be special, to be honest. Um, it really does feel like it could be special with some of the storylines coming out of this. Um, the opportunity to compete in the three arenas, obviously the massive one as well, in front of a home crowd and in such a massive arena. So, yeah, no, I, I, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to this now. I think it could be 
a massive night for Irish MMA and kind of kickstart uh, whatever series of shows Cage Warriors coming back regularly to the three arena. 100%. Look, at, uh, let's talk about the top three fights first. Let's bring in Redzer for the interview. We can break down the rest of the card after that interview a little bit as well. I'm going to go to you first, Andy. Uh, Reese McKee versus Judo Jimmy Wallhead. A fascinating, fascinating fight uh, at the top of the welterweight division. It's going to unify the welterweight championship. One of the best stories coming out of Cage Warriors last year, two or three of the best stories involved both of these guys look at you obviously had the resurgence of jimmy wallhead coming in there uh getting that title over with his win over figlack and shocking uh, the whole of the scene really with the way he went out and dispatched figlack by knockout um i think myself and jo- shawnee were joking on the big podcast this week saying that maybe his new nickname should be knockout jimmy wallhead instead of judo jimmy wallhead <laughs> but reese mckee in his own right coming in there obviously after uh, not having his UFC tenure going all that well, came in, great win against Mantikivi, fantastic win against Justin Burlinson in, in a fight that got everybody talking the last time out. He has the chance now to, to go back to the tree arena where he started his professional career and unify the titles and hopefully create another avenue for a second chance at a UFC uh, run as well. I mean, the stories coming in of this and the stories that are going to come out of this fight are going to be next to none. When the actually cage doors closes, what are you expecting to see in the fight itself? In the fight itself, um, I'm expecting to see a great fight for as long as it lasts. Um, I don't know if this fight goes five rounds. I I, I would be surprised if it did. I think we're going to see a finish in here. Um, and I think we're probably going to see a war uh, for as long as it lasts. Look, Ju- Judo Jim Wall had 44 fights into his career. He's seen it. He's done it all. Um, I don't know. I, I think that he he definitely had look we we saw what he did um to Figlack so there's there's no counting J, uh, judo Jim out I just feel and I don't think this is any sort of Irish bias in any way I just feel that Reese McKee is the man right now um I really feel that Reese McKee is the best fighter he's ever been I feel like he's grown um you know with age but also in you know he's he's filled out into his body his skill set is so well refined he's he's uh the way that he has responded to that ufc run has been nothing short of incredible to me and obviously his last fight out was against justin burlinson and he did not have it easy he looked like he was on the verge of being stopped at a point in that fight um but he found a way to win he found a way to to gut it out to crawl back to get up and uh and to put on the performance of a lifetime to get that finish um i thought he's looked absolutely sublime in in the fight before that against mantikivi and i really think that he's continuing to grow here um and it just feels like this is Reese McKee's moment. Like I know that there's some I don't know what it is. I don't I really don't know what it is. And I don't know if I'm getting this wrong. And I and I'm not a I wasn't in Belfast, so maybe it's just a case that I'm gonna be there on on uh, next on fr- on Saturday night. But even though everything about the Belfast event was Reese McKee's crowning moment, he became the champion, it was in his hometown. Something feels just a little different to me where I'm like, this is Reese McKee's time. Like this is this is this could be the performance that really says, you know what, this isn't the Reese McKee that went into the UFC last time, and it's about time that that he gets the respect he's he's been earning over the last number of fights to to get him that in at uh, that second chance again. Um, now, that's all assuming it goes to plan. Um, but Jesus, he's got a fight in his hands here in Judo Jim Wallhead, and he's not going to be able to be put away yet very, any easily at all. No, no, it's definitely going to be a, like a good win if Reese can get it done. And I, I'm, I'm like you, very, very confident that he can get it done as well. And I'll bring you in in, in just a moment, Quilcha. Um, when I'm looking at Reese, uh, I'm always amazed by his mentality, where is what it appears to me is that he never lets the occasion get to him and he never has. I don't, I think, you know, when you're talking about a guy who made his professional debut in this same arena in front of a big, big crowd and kind of, you know, the rest is history. Coming in here, Quilcha, like, I think I'd agree with Andy and said this is his crowning moment and, you know, this is his time in his career. And we could arguably say the same thing for his next fight again after this and his next fight again after this. But he has to worry about the task at hand. He has to worry about judo Jimmy Wallhead, who I feel is going to come in here with nothing to lose. Uh, has kind of come to terms with the fact that this is probably going to be his last fight in mixed martial arts. And, you know, we talk about fighters who have talked about retirement 
time and time and it's not a good thing to hear before a fight but I think it's a good thing if you come to terms with it before it actually happens and it seems to me that judo Jimmy Wallhead has kind of done that coming into this fight so he's kind of coming in here with nothing to lose and a guy coming in here with nothing to lose can be a very very dangerous dangerous opponent to face off against exactly if you um a lot we hear a lot of fighters retiring there's the ongoing joke of MMA retirements but in this case it doesn't seem to be it he's he's a you know, he's had a, a long tenure in the sport. He's won belts and most recently getting the interim belt, having nothing to lose, I think makes him a lot more dangerous, but makes this a bit more exciting because he might take a lot more risks to try and go out on a bit on a high. And that could cause Reese McGee a lot of problems, but could also turn this into a really, really entertaining fight. Um you got two people got two fighters in different stages of their career now. Reese is probably hitting his prime. Or just before, yeah, he's probably just hitting his prime now. While you, Jimmy Wallhead, who's just come to the end, and uh, it's a beautiful story, really. When you see that, it's kind of like a passing of the guard in a sense as well. Uh, on top of that, what the one thing I'm loving about this fight, it gives me kind of maybe a little bit of nostalgia to the days where you would have had to get to the UFC. You get this former UFC veteran with a lot of fights in, into Ireland against one of the local talents. And this might be the fight to springboard them to be the next star for Ireland and fly the flag in the UFC. And um, that's the one thing that stands out about this fight for me. And I really like that. And um, that bit of nostalgia makes me even more excited, to be honest. Yeah, very, very well said. Quilcha, I'll stick with you for the co-main event. Look, we can maybe share our brief thoughts because we do talk a lot about James Sheehan versus Oban Elliott with Paul, who will be coming on with us next. But I think we're all in agreement here that I'm looking at this as a title eliminator fight. No matter what happens in the Reese McKee fight, no matter who is still around or who is the champion, you've got to feel that it's either James Sheehan or Oban Elliott, whoever gets their hand raised, has got to be next in line for the for the 175 pound title um on saturday night it's a fantastic fight in the co-main event two very well matched guys two guys on the rise in the division as well high on confidence on win streaks this fight just ticks off all the boxes that's exactly it um two guys that it's probably not been said out loud i think we say it said in the interview with uh with paul but it's not been said out loud this is the next this is number one contender but realistically it should be um it's a shame because both are really likable fighters they're really good to watch and now we're seeing them against each other now when you when you like both fighters like oh you want to see them both do well but ones always have to lose and that's where you get these two pro- prospects pit pit them against each other and it can it just creates all sort of all sorts of fireworks and yeah look we've done plenty talking about the fight i would recommend everyone to go watch the interviews that have been done with Open Elliot and James Sheen on Severe Made a Common Sure Dog, which was done with uh, Sean Sheen. And like they really hype you up for the fight. I've watched both now and they've really gotten me excited for this. Absolutely. Yeah. Anthony uh, Anthony Jeremy and Andy, um you had a, a, <laughs> all right, but um you had a <laughs> you had a, a a conversation with James ahead of this fight. You were there. What what were kind of the vibes you were getting from James head on into this fight? I kind of said it with Paul. It's like two guys who are exuding confidence here, whereas mm-hmm. Oban kind of portrays it a lot more than I think that James does, but I'm not saying that James isn't confident at all. I think James has a quite confidence around him coming into this fight, and it's a, a, going to be a real good test for him to see where he's at in his career. Mm, there's just no bullshit there's no bullshit at all between them um and, and I, I i say the same for oban um like i know we've oban can come out with kind of braggadocious statements and stuff but he's not really a, he's not really a shit talker like he's he's someone who's like yeah like he, he'll ha- he's happy to talk but at the end of the day he's like yeah but like this is all you know it's all bullshit anyway until we get in there and you know it's it's i'm looking across the cage from him and and james is the same like they're they just they're just like yeah like this is all cool this is like we can hype this fight that's all well and good but we're going to get in there and fight um and it's going to be a war and it's going to be a dog fight and we're going to see who the better man is and that's kind of their fighting styles also it's like they're not timid fighters who will sit back and you know play the waiting game and look you know be not that this is necessarily a bad thing because there's some phenomenal fighters who will sit back and play you know counter punching game or will look for very patiently look for their holes these are two lads that are going to walk forward and collide into each other um, with calculated aggression. And, and I think it's going to make for an absolutely tremendous fight. Um, James Sheen, he's shown me 
a lot, especially in, in that fight against, um, of course, forgetting his name now when I'm on the spot. Um, the last one out, uh, Jamie Richardson. 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 Yeah. Like, and, and he talked a little bit about maybe giving him a little bit too much respect. Um, so I'd be interested to see how he's learned from that and, uh, and what kind of, what level of respect in the cage he gives to, to open Elliot. Um, yeah, I, I can't wait. It's it's a banger. I, I don't even need to. I just want to watch it. I just want to watch no, it. I think we, we don't we don't have to like sell this fight yeah. at all. I think you know it, we're stating the obvious when it comes to this. But and yeah. I think the same can be said, Andy, about the next fight as well, Tobias Aurelia versus Ryan Shelley. Mm. I mean, unbelievable stylistic matchup here. Like I'm so curious. It's you know. I don't know what, what people are talking about this, but I think this is the perfect test at the perfect time for Ryan Shelley because, you know, he started his MMA career a little bit later than others would have had the opportunity to. And yeah, even to come in and fight someone like Tobias Rilla, what, 6-0 and right now, you know, some people might argue that it's too soon. I say, no way. I think mm-hmm. Ryan Shelley has proved at this moment with his previous performances that he deserves a challenge like this as well. And it's a real fight too. That is going to put two of these guys in probably the hottest division in 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 Cage Warriors right now, right into title contention as well with a win. Just curious to hear your thoughts. You spoke with Ryan ahead of this fight as well. What's the vibes that you're getting off of him? I, I, I actually didn't get to I didn't get to speak with Ryan. Unfortunately, I spoke with Adam, but um, Adam. but but on this fight, just on the point you made there about you know could it be too soon when you go in and finish. Uh, perennial title contender in Cage Warriors, 19 fight veteran Josh Crazy Horse Reed inside three minutes. There is no, there's no waiting around. There is no mm-hmm. too soon for anything else. Uh, and in fact, you could even argue that that was a, a you know, a, a tough, a very different fight. But a, if we're talking too soon, a 19 fight veteran like Josh Reed um, against Tobias Cerulli, I think that we're going to see a different. We, I don't know what we're going to see. But if if Ryan Shelley is who we think he is, then we're going to see one a phenomenal performance, and we're going to see two and a completely different aspect of of Ryan Shelley because he comes from a, a very polished striking background. But you're going in here against Tobias Huvrila, who he he just causes car crashes in fights. He's like I, I think of him as like Cage Warriors version of Justin Gaethje in ways where he's going to be walking kind of coming forward and there's going to be limbs and sharp edges of his body just coming flying at you, looking to cut you up, looking to to hurt you from every single position. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how Ryan Shelley deals with that. Will he be looking to take it to the ground? Will he be looking to, to get it down and get a quick sub um, like he, he managed to do in the Josh Reed fight? Um, and look, the, the, the knockout that Tobias Herrilla had in his last fight with the step-in elbow off the cage... That that terrifies me. Um, that's a f- if I'm Ryan Shelley, I'm like fuck. This is this. I could get hurt in this fight. Um, but it makes for one hell of a matchup. And, and it's, it makes the hairs of my hairs of my arms stand up when I think about it. You know, putting yourself in there with a dangerous opponent too can all like it can almost quill shit put you into a new higher gear altogether when you do and you are more comfortable with the circumstances that you may face. Like, look, obviously there's a damn good chance every fight that you get in there that you're going to get hurt some way. But like you're you're dealing with a stylistic guy here and Ryan will be dealing with a stylistic guy in Tobias who's going to move forward, who's going to be in his face, who's got good power, who's not afraid to grapple as well. And, and I, I think for me, th- my interest is, is to see how Ryan Shelley deals with his style when he does get in there. I mean, what are you thinking along those lines? How do you deal with somebody like Tobias Herrilla? Like, I mean, there's two different ways. You could um, you could go and do the William Gomez and kind of fight on your bike, and I think Ryan Shelley is capable of doing that. But uh, Samuel Bark went in there and fought fire with fire, and we saw how good he was. He was very good in the clinch. So, I mean, you've seen two kind of different kind of ways that Tobias Cerilla can be beaten. So you have stuff to work off if you're Ryan Ke- Shelley and Chris and Tom and stuff like that, you know? So that can give you a little bit of confidence coming in here as an undefeated fighter. But back to the question, I guess, what would you like to kind of see from F- Ryan Shelley? What do you think he should be kind of bringing in here to kind of get the job done? From an entertainment perspective, I'd love to see him use that Taekwondo and kind of stick in the outside and kind of similar to William Gomez in a sense. And, pick his shots well and keep in the outside and don't leave Tobias Huria engage and 
allow him to get off those extremely violent shots that he's very much known for. Um, if the Haria that showed up in the Bark fight turns up, I think there's it, it could be very it could be a very different fight, and it, Shelley could take over in that one personally. I, I think because I don't think Haria looked himself in that one. Um, the ground game is the other side of it, where you take him down and get the submission. We I think I saw that in a, back at the Fight Club Rush fights where he got submitted. I think it was his first loss. Um, there was it's a long time ago, and those things would be after those things would be after being tidied up, but there you never know. Uh, we saw just how good Shelley was in his last fight. So if he go, takes that approach, um, it's a it's a safe way of winning without taking as much damage in what could be a potential firefight if it does stay on the feet for so long. So uh, yeah, from an entertainment perspective, I'd love to see the stand and banging happening, but uh, from a keeping damage mitigation and cleaner fight and to allow yourself to compete and as soon as possible afterwards, get it down to the ground and try and take that back. There's also a very good chance that you might see both in this fight as well, depending on how, how it goes. Look, that was the top three fights. We wanted to kind of get a little bit sunk into them. But let's get sunk into our interview with Paul Redzer Redmond. Uh, about, what was it, a year and a half after retirement now? We just caught up with him, seeing how things are going. And we caught uh, his opinion on a couple of the fights on the Cage Warriors card. He will be there, obviously, with James Sheehan and Adam Darby. And also, um, I'm sure he'll have play some part in some of the preparation with uh, Solomon Simon as well. Um, let's go ahead over to Andy. He's going to take us away for the interview with Paul Red Redmond. And now we're joined by Irish MMA legend, Cage Warriors veteran, KSW, Bellator, UFC, every promotion under the sun. Big Red, DJ Paul E.D., Paul Redmond, how are you? Do what I do it all. A man of many talents, they say. <laughs> What's happening, Ari? How are you? Listen, we wanted to get you on um, because there's a big L Cage Warriors car coming up and no yeah. better man to chat about it with. But we also wanted to check in with you. Our, our friendly neighborhood, Paul Redmond, uh, life and retirement coach, a coach, Paul Redmond, I hear these days as well. No, nah, um, I don't mean. <laughs> you, know, you keep saying no, but I think it is. I think it's a yeah. Um, look, it's it's probably around a year now, isn't it, since you retired? Um, uh, how's life? A little bit more than a year, probably about a year and a half. Um, yeah, grand deal. I just, I'm, nothing's really changed. The only thing that's changed is uh, I. Just no comp no MMA competition. Like I'm still in the gym every night of the week. I'm still hitting the gym, uh, lifting weights and stuff more than I would more than I would have. I've actually put on a bit of timber since I have retired. Uh living the good life. So I'm up about probably another six or seven kilos that I used to walk around that. Um but other than that, uh, a lot more golf as well, uh, you know, and coaching the lads up in the gym. But do you know what? I'm actually, I'm actually really enjoying it, to be honest. What's the uh, handicap in golf these days? <laughs> Fucking shock. <laughs> I, I was <laughs> off 16, then I went down to 20 and back down to 18. So, I mean, it's all right. It's steady enough. Yeah. Are you? Is there any other golfers in Rhino or just yourself? Yeah, no, I've got a few of them. So, yeah. Uh, um, Robbie, uh, he's uh, he's he teaches the judo. Uh, he's he used to play off about twelve. He comes out with me a couple of times. We've got a PJ instructor in the gym, Paul Mac, uh, Paul McLaughlin. Um, there's a few of them, yeah, but you're not allowed to mention it in front of Andy because he goes nuts. Why? He just hates the sport. <laughs> <laughs> he just fucking so hates it. He's probably is he? I don't know. Do you know what is uh, Paul? So Paul McLaughlin would have uh, like he'd he'd say uh, like sort of second hand clubs, and I think he's after giving Andy a say. So I'm, if I if I get a hold of him, I'm gonna do like a, a nine hole vlog with Andy one of the days. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how's the DJ going? DJ, right, yeah, I don't know. I've always done that. I've actually done that longer than MMA. Um, so I'm still tipping away the usual pub club scene um, that I've always done, even when I was sort of competing in MMA, I, I still did it. Um, so nothing's really changed there. Like I said, not, not a whole lot has changed since uh, since retiring. I've just been able to eat a little bit more and not been as stressed as I used to be. <laughs> yeah. We look like right after like the question is always like I remember asking it's like oh what you know why is you retire and everyone it's a question everyone asks but I feel like a year goes by or a year and a half as you said and there's a bit more perspective there 
Um, looking back on it now, like, did you feel like you made the right decision in retirement? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, if I, if if the injuries hadn't caught up with me, like I think I was signed to fight uh, Ryan Scope and Bellator in France, um, in Paris on the first Paris show that time, and I think it was in the summer, and. Uh, he was sparring James Shane or wrestling him or something one of the days and I felt a pop in my rib I was about two weeks out from the fight and I couldn't breathe I couldn't I couldn't really do anything for about two weeks um, I, could, like, I couldn't train and I couldn't really cut weight uh, so I had to pull out of that and then I was about a week out from fighting Medi Ben Lacta um, and I, have an issue, I had an issue with my elbow and I was actually cutting weight. It was the Tuesday. It was it was it had been at me for about a week, and I, I didn't really specifically do anything in training. Like I never, you know, went over on it or sparred hard or, or felt anything pop or break in my arm. I just remember me at me me the back of my elbow was sort of swelled up, and I couldn't really move it, and I was in agony. And you know, it, it got to the I was taking bleeding, no offense to beat the band just to kill the pain. And trying. then I was going out on runs and I wouldn't spar. But this was, it was this is only in the space of the latter the final week of hard training. Like, so I got around to the Monday of cutting weight. Of, I was meant to travel on the Friday. I was meant to be fighting them over in the UK somewhere. And I genuinely couldn't move my arm. And I was saying to myself, like, what am I going to do here? I, I can't even throw a punch. So I went up to the A and E. They thought it was a fracture. They diagnosed it as a fracture and put me in a, a cast, uh, not a, like a sling for about six weeks. And I came out of that, went back training a little bit, and it blew up again. And I didn't really know what was going on. And uh, it, it sort of was the swelling was going back and forth and back and forth. And some days you'd have movement in it, and other days you didn't. So I went and got the, the MRI, and it showed I still, I still actually have it. So on my left arm, that's my arm, Max. There, well, I can't straighten that anymore. Oh really? That, that's that's so that, that's a that's a straight arm. That's the bogey arm. So I, I still have to get surgery on this arm. It, I was meant to get it done at the end of uh, last month, and it got post, postponed till the end of June. And there's two fragments sitting in the back of the elbow, and I just can't open it and close it. Like it's still giving me pain. And some days you'll ha- you'll have good days on it in the gym, and uh, some days you'll have bad uh, uh, a bad few hours on it as well. So. Um, once those injuries started coming in thick and fast, I think I was only about 34 when I retired or when I pulled the plug, which isn't uh, specifically uh, an older age for an MMA, really. You know, you probably could have got another two years out of it. And, but then I was thinking to myself, all right, the injuries were coming in a little bit thick and fast. I probably could have got a couple more fights. But where I was at in my career, the checks that were coming in didn't really make it financially viable for me to keep it on continuing um, so I was at the putting in two full training camps because I pulled out for um, and I, I wouldn't be the one for pulling out uh, of fights you, you all know this uh, uh, throughout my whole career like uh, I was the go to guy if they wanted guys to come in on a week notice uh, you know um, backup guy I just I used to fight everyone which is no big deal but um, when I found I had to sort of pull out fights, it was just, you know, it wasn't my me. And on top of that, then the, the money didn't make sense. But because I had to, already done two full camps um, for those two fights, I never got the, I never got the final payout for it of, of either camp, you know. So I never actually went. And, and, and look, it's, it's uh, for me, it was never about the money. But when you're putting in two back to back sort of camps and there's nothing to, at the end of it to show for it. Yeah, sort of scratching your head saying, hang on a minute, I, I might have been doing this for so long. Is it worth doing anymore? And for me, the, the whole retirement thing was, it was a, yeah, it was a good choice for me. I think I think it was just the right time and it was just, for me, it, yeah, it was the right time. It sounds like it was less about the fights themselves and actually making it to the fights. And like, I imagine that had an impact then on, like you obviously, you work outside of MMA. It's not like you were just a full-time professional fighter. You have other jobs as well. Yeah, well, at the, at the, the time I was, at the time, I was working 40 hours a week on on building sites. And he would say, he'd be up at the crack of dawn and then he would uh, just going to work anyways and he would train sort of hard anyways. But, you know, we still train quite hard regardless. Uh, but then if you throw, throw a fight camp in on top of that, you're trying to tre- squeeze in your second session every day. And, you know, you might have to go running before I walk to cut that weight. And you might have to get off on your lunch break or maybe get out an hour earlier just to go do your full session, rest for an hour and then, put in a second session so I've always done that myself and Neil you know Neil used to go running 
to walk. I think it was about seven or eight k, and he'd, he'd do his walk, and then he'd run home. And he'd have about an hour or two, and he'd go to training that night. So we just it was something we've always done, you know. Um, but like I said, I, I didn't make the last two fights, and I, I'm not able to waste anyone's time or anything like that. You know, throughout the years, I've had. Surgery. I've, I've snapped my ankle before in training. I've had torn rotator cuff, smashed face in KSW. This thing going on with my arm, broken hands left, right, and centre. So, you know, um, it, it's not fucking chess that we're playing. You know, it's it, once you deal for what we've been doing for about 13, 14 years, um, it's taxing on the body. Uh, so, look, like I said, it's just the right time for me. Like, Paul, it, that sounded like, yeah, the right time and your body was telling you is the right time. And I guess the biggest kind of adjustment you have to make now is you know you said not too much has changed you're in there helping the lads in the gym but then you don't have the final goal of competing anymore and, and maybe scratching that itch to compete like how do you kind of substitute that in is it competing in grappling tournaments and stuff like that or do you even miss you know competing what? at all yeah I, I, like, I really like the one I've, I've done Polaris twice now um for grappling but Andy's always happy to sort of do the local grappling shows and not that I'm too good for the rat like that. That's not where I'm at. There's, there's there's guys out there and you know that come to the IBGF team that put me in my place uh or you know any other day of the week. Like so I'm not saying uh, that's not what I'm getting at here. I just cannot get mo I can't get motivated for the local IBGF tournament or even for the, even if it's fucking the Euros or the Pan Am. I just can't get motivated for it. I'll be on the edge of the mat and I'm just like, all right, it's jiu jitsu what's the worst thing that can fucking happen here and you know happen, all right, sorry yeah you got me fair play to you and I just I, I, me, I can't get woke up about it and for whatever reason I do for the likes of a Polaris or something like that you know there's a big crowd and that's there specifically to watch you um, for 10 minutes and you have a bit of an audience there as well and it's, it goes out live uh, and there's a lot of interest in it across the world so that piques me interest a little bit uh, so I've been on that. I'm two and zero in Polaris, uh, trying to get back on the show. Um, I've been on to the guys a couple of times, but I, I, I would grapple with my arm like this now, and I, I have done that at the start of last year. I, 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 I win against um, Magnus. Oh, I, can't even, I can't remember his name. Um, but a good win against Thomas, him. Thomas this, Magnus, is it? That's the one. Sorry. Um, or a good win with, against him, even with this elbow like this. So if I got this sorted, you know. Um, but then you're saying to yourself, you know. I'm told I'm told to seven in a couple of months as well. Now, again, that's not specifically old old, but the last thing you want to be doing. Are you now, getting on though? It, it, yeah, touching on, but the last thing you want to be doing is being used as a stepping stone. Even in, even if I was to hang around in MMA, you be used as a stepping stone for young guys coming through, and you know, oh, uh, that's red red with a, a name that has fought everywhere. We never wanted to be that guy. And even in jujitsu, it's like that. Like I train jujitsu. Maybe five times a week now, four or five times a week in the evenings. Um, I'll do my runs and I'll, I'll, I'll hit my weights just for me personally. There's not the intensity level isn't what it used to be when I was fighting MMA. So you have to even think we are um, we are at in, in jiu jitsu. Like, I'm never gonna fight, I'm never gonna grapple one of the Rutler brothers or anything and put it up against one of them or you know, one of those guys. So it, but there is competitive matches out there. If you look at the likes of Phil Harris. In Polaris, he's retired a couple of years. I think he, I think Fields uh, just push push him forty, um, and he said he, he he they put him with similar ages uh, brackets and stuff like that for his matches. And the matches that he does do and go against in there, they're great matches. So look, I, 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 I know where I'm at in the sport. I know where I'm at in general between MMA and Jiu Jitsu, and I, I actually think it's a it's a place that, or sorry, it's a, it's a thing that fighters and, and and people with that competitive edge they don't realise where they're at as they're going forward. They think they're still getting the 38, 39, oh, I'll still knock out this kid that's living in the gym or, you know, you, you need to know where you're at and I'm a realist more than that than else. Uh, I think you yeah, definitely are a realist and I think that's why people have always respected you and your career. Like I, I was listening to, look, you don't like calling yourself a coach. Maybe I'll call you an advisor and, uh, and to <laughs> some of the younger lads that is coming up in Team Rhino right now. And I was listening to James Sheehan's interview with Andy and he's just talking about the progression of his career. And he mentioned you and, you know, he said that he didn't want to rush anything. Not saying that he particularly said you rushed anything. But no, you I, say I rushed the interview, yeah. 
Yeah, you were you were you were offered an opportunity to fight in the UFC, and you almost damn ke- killed yourself to get down to the way yeah. to fight there as well. And I was glad to hear him say that too, because that's obviously advice that's coming from you, and and you're telling him not to rush it. Maybe do you look at back at that experience and what you did there? Um, not as a regret, but would you wish that you had a, had a different kind of experience with the UFC and, and that's why you're giving the advice to James not to rush anything and just to wait for your opportunity? Do you know what? I think um, James takes it. Like, it's not just me in the gym that's, that's telling James whatever. It's, you know, series obviously there and then obviously the, the, the main man, Andy, we'd be telling him uh, just our own experiences. And I think if you listen to James talk or, if you know James uh, personally, he's a clever dude. You know, he's a smart guy. So he 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 can see from an outside looking in. Um, he wasn't in the gym sort of when all that was going down years ago. Um, but he's a smart guy, and you know he, he's able to figure that stuff out for himself. Like it's not the, it's not like even looking back. And at the time, we knew <laughs> this is fucking nuts. Like you know, how do we make this way and all that shit? We knew it, but it was, at, at the time that had been. Only Conor and Neil were signed to the UFC at the time. So, what do you do? do, do, do are they going to come back around? The stories of uh, people throwing them down and then getting in, like Paddy Pimblett, that, that that all happened after us, you know. Um, so, just at the time when the phone call came in, we were just like, you know, do we do all this? So, we just we did it. What, just said, what, was, what was going through your mind when you were going through that way, Cut? Yeah. Starving, fucking. You think. Uh, you think all you're thinking of is weight right? every morning every minute every you know if you have a black coffee you're thinking Jesus Christ there could be two calories in that or I'm going to be heavier in the morning you know it's absurd what's going through your head and it's all specifically to do with can I make this weight you're not thinking about you genuinely aren't thinking about how bad it's going to affect you your inside your this your that can I make can I kind of rehydrate well? Can, it, actually, not even. I wasn't even thinking about the fight. It, the, the fight is so far removed from when somebody tells you you have to cut that weight. It's uh, it's looking back on it now. It's a bit surreal, uh, and I actually don't know how I done it. I know there's a couple of people out there that did something close. I actually know Stevie Ray cut about thirty in about maybe a little bit over two and a half weeks. I think Rob Wife had done about thirty in about two two and a half three weeks. The Damien Brown that I fought from uh, Australia, he had a big weight cut like that. Again, short notice for the UFC. And they were all going to their own weight. I had never fought a 45 before. I'm, I'm a big lump. And I'm big enough. Like I, was start, I, was, I, I used to train with Stevie and Troy Star, and I'm tra- training with him over in uh, Scotland and that. And standing next to Stevie, I'm not small by any chance. Like I'm not small, lightweight by any uh, stretch of the imagination. So uh, to make one 45. Even if, even when we did it set, uh, with a long period, like even for the Rob Wyford fight, we had like three or four months notice, and it took me three months to get down to four percent body fat just for that weight, and I still had to take eight kilos of water out of my body the night before, and I just I I, I took a big big left hand off Rob who hits quite hard, um, and that put me out. My only regret is, is my only regret. In sort of anything is not not so much taking it out for our forty five. That was the opportunity, so it was up to us to say either yes or no. We said yeah, but they put my face all over Dublin when uh, they were coming. Then when they were rocking into town with all the banners and this, you know, in Dublin Airport and shit like that, put me on the card. Let me do it at one fifty five just once. I'm, I was good enough at one fifty five. I was good enough to give any of them uh, any of them a good scrap, you know. I sparred uh, Joseph Duffy a lot when I was in Troy Star. Same with Stevie Ray. Um, I've beaten guys who have who have had wins in the UFC. Damian Brown, uh, Adam Lobov, you know, with wins over these guys as well. Um, so I would have just loved to do it at one fifty five. But them's the breaks. I don't cry about it. I'm fucking geek about me, you know. Just for anyone who who a lot of people be listening there are probably like amateurs in Ireland and stuff, they they might not know exactly. How much exactly did you cut? I think at the time so it's a bit of a weird one because <clears throat> for three years before that, the Cage Warriors were always putting one on on New Year's Eve or two years before that. And I, I think I'd done one myself in around 
the, the start of January. So it meant I was cutting weight for three years, three consecutive years over the Christmas. That year, Cage Warriors were meant to have a show coming up on New, on New Year's Eve. And we had done like six weeks of camp. And then at the last minute, Cage Warriors, they... So I, I, it's when they went sort of remember that they went missing for about two years. They didn't. There was no shows, but that was that. They just they they cancelled that card and it didn't happen. So I said to Andy, "Look, I'm gonna enjoy my Christmas this year. I was cutting weight. I'm after doing three years. Yeah, yeah. You know, go nuts. It didn't really go too nuts, and I was training with Siri all over that Christmas, anyways, because he needed a sparring partner because he was fighting on this week card, anyways. But I remember going back into work on the Monday. So three days before I got the phone call off Andy and I remember getting on the scales and I was 84.8 kilos which at the time was heavy heavy for me I used to walk around at 80 maybe 81 so I said to myself on the Monday right let's start you know watching me wait a little bit get it back down cage where is going to come back around about March, April and we'd be good to go so from the Monday, I cut like three kilos. That morning, I was 82.5 or something, and then I got the call. So from the day I got the call, it would have been 82.5 kilos down to 66.3, whatever that is. A lot of weight. It's a lot of weight. I think I, I, think we, I think I walked out with something like 36, 37 pounds, um, and I got, I think I was a pound shy. Crazy. Crazy. Crazy, crazy times. But uh, outside of the madness of the weight cuts and everything, w- looking back in the career, you fought in the early days of where battle zone, chaos, and then all the way to the three arena in KSW and the massive stadiums and crowds. Yeah. What's, what was the highlight for you looking back in your career in MMA? Best fight or just, just in general? For personally, what's the, what's the highlight for you? Be it a fight, moment, anything? Uh, I think it was was it the first fight in the three arena? No, it, it it was the fight and the moment itself for me. Um, it was the Norman Park fight up in uh, yeah. Belfast that time, and I remember we done a, you know we done we done the whole press conference thing, and we did a, it was a big build up to it. Um, Big way in, big thing. Me and Norm were headlining. Bellator were after a big show, and I remember just I was come up, I was walking through sort of to where they bring you up to the top of the ramp as you walk down, you know. And I was I was standing in just behind the the, the two big screens, and Norman's at the walking down ahead of me. He's just walking into the ring, and the place is pretty full for us, and everyone's shouting my name. And I just remember thinking to myself, "How the fuck?" Do you go from how did I end up getting here? Just I just looked around and says, "How the fuck am I in this scenario? Where I'm going out to fight a fella in a cage? It, how do you, how does one go from not being a fighter, or not growing up like with MMA or boxing, and like, that just thought ran through my head for like a split second? Then they called me out. Then it was show time. We went down and did the fight. To be honest, that's actually my favorite fight. Even though I lost, it's still my favorite fight today. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I love it. But um, <laughs> it's an awkward silence there. Fucking hell. Yeah, I was yeah. like, that was me. That was like, because I'm waiting my more story or something. Like that. that was it. That's it. I just messed, That's I just messed around with my microphone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but like, that's that, that fight. I remember that fight. The fight was fantastic. But uh, you've just looking at the scene as well and from the battles and looking, I said the battle zone ones and everything. But how have you, from looking at the, how, the scene in Ireland's developed since you the 2010 onwards. What's it been like looking from your perspective and being part of it as well to up to the point we're at now? Um, I only sort of realised what way it's gone the last couple of years. You know, when I was still competing, I never really took, I never, I never really gave up on it. About to be honest, I was, I never really sort of. Uh, looked at any, what anyone else was doing, what was going around. I was always just, it was tunnel vision, what I was doing. I was worried about my own fights and my own competitions and my own teammates and training. I never really took notice of what was going down. The build. Like, I know technically I was like the first coach of the Irish team over in Vegas a few years back. And um, I think that was after it came out of UFC in about 
2016, I think I did it. And um, to do that, and then look, I, I got asked the question by Liam O'Grippen there a couple of months ago. We were doing like one of the, the squad training sessions, and he was saying, how, how have you seen that end develop? So from being where doing the coach for the first year, we'd, we'd know like team track suits, no... Nobody knew sort of what was doing anything. All it was was I was there. I went over as a corner man for all the fighters. Um, all the fighters paid their own way. There was no squad session. You just paid your entry into it. That was it. And looking from what it's gone from then to now with the specific team, how you get into it, how you get ranked in the country, um, the nationals, the euros, the worlds, the it's it's. It's a completely. It's going. It is going the whole boxing route of that's an amateur. Not that it was never an, an amateur sport. And this, but it's you know they're wearing the rash guards, the shin guards. There's a lot more safety involved. And they've got to get the the head scans too, um, to make sure everything's all right with the, the fighters. So to see it from from that to what it is now, it, it's unbelievable. And to be honest, I, I think it's only going to um, create better fighters um, going going into the pro ranks. And I think it'll get. I think I think you'll get the the difference of who wants to go pro, who wants to stay amateur. Not everyone wants to go pro, but I think years ago it was sort of you did like a couple of couple of amateur fights, and it was just a given that you were going to go pro. Or a few people might have gone to pro real two or three fights, didn't fancy it, and then can't go back to the amateur thing and do it at three minutes again. So maybe the pro life isn't isn't for everyone, you know. So I do I think it's it's really good that way. You're... Andy, go ahead. No, no, no. You fired at me. I'm just going to talk to you, Reggie. You're not on the commentary route for Cage Warriors coming up this weekend. Uh, no, I'm in, the, I'm in the one for Rome the week after. Nice. You'll be able to 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 commentate on Caden Lochran's world title fight. Then yes, we have... I'm actually really looking forward to that for you. Yeah, we actually have him on the podcast as well today as well. So two good guests on today. But look, at you're going to be uh, trading the microphone for the towel. I guess you'll be with... James Sheen, you'll be with Adam Darby next Saturday yeah. night. But let's talk about James Sheen and Oban Elliott first. You know, Cracker. absolutely one of the best fights that you're going to see next weekend. I cannot wait to see that fight too. Guys, on the rise, this is a title eliminator shot in my opinion. Do yeah. oh, oh, you know, uh, has anyone come out and said it? Uh, we only had a conversation with Andy about this the other day, you know. I think so. I think it's the title eliminator. I think everyone was just, I think it, it's public, it's the public it is saying the title limit. It should be. Mm-hmm. And if it was me, I would bring the winner of the for, the fight in. Sorry, camera's new. Um, I would bring the winner of that, that fight into the winner of the main event in the middle of cage in the middle of the the, the tree arena and say this is that this is who's going next. You know, but I'm not in there. All right, but <laughs> that's that's just my thoughts on it. Yeah, that, do, that'd be brilliant. But I think the. The only issue there is, like, you know, Freeze wins, you would assume he's gone to the UFC, so that's where it could get a little bit... Is it, and, and, is it and, and, though? And she... I think... I think... I think Freeze is definitely good enough to be in the UFC. We all know that. And, you know, we all know how tough he is, especially after seeing the Burlington fight, you know, what he can what he can overcome. Um, but I don't think... This is not This is just me from an outside looking in. Um, what's wrong with giving him... Uh, or what's wrong with letting him... Just defend his belt once, because some of the some of the champions are going straight after to get the belt. And I know Reese had the belt and the event and this and that. Give him another chance to defend it. What's the rush again? You know, what's he what's he after the UFC post UFC two three? Yeah, so he's had he had the Mantikivi fight and then he had the Burlington fight. Um, All right, so two. This would be his third fight. Yeah. Um. You know, maybe. Maybe okay, three fights. Maybe the UFC again, but realistically, give him one more. Just say right. I give him. I let him go to the UFC, but maybe the UFC. You know, the top wrestlers. Maybe then. Maybe they're not looking for welterweights. All right. So if they're not looking for welterweights, does he go? Does he go again, or does he wait for a late another late notice call that could or could not happen potentially? So nobody knows. So I think. Even if they even if they walk the winner into the the uh, walk the winner of James and Auburn into the main event and he did get signed, it makes no odds in any ways. It's just, just a, it just happened on the night in the three arena and created a bit of a buzz. 
What What do you think about like so? Obviously, in that's let's say in that scenario where where Reese wins and James wins, it's obviously yeah. two Irish fighters. Now I I go back and forth, but a lot of time I'm saying why not? Like I I have no issue with Irish fighters competing against each other. What's your no. take on that? No. So me and Norman did it, made fuck all of a difference. There's other for Irish fighters every other point each other every other day of the week. Um both want to see their own careers develop and go further. Both don't owe anything to each other. <laughs> you know, they're from two different teams at opposite end of the countries. Go nuts. Fair enough, fair enough. I, I, when you're looking at Oban Elliott as a fighter, very strong mentality, very confident as is James. I would kind of label James as quietly confident, whereas Oban, he doesn't, he's not afraid to express how he I thinks like, he I, is. I really like Oban. I have to say, yeah, really yeah, like he's him. a great, great character and gave a great interview with Sean Sheehan as well. And I think James and him, no, James gave a great interview with Andy, and obviously Oban did with Sean. The two of them are selling this fight as well. They're really helping us to buy into this fight. Skills for skills. I mean. This is it's as close a fight as I'll ever see, to be honest. Yeah, I think uh, I think Oban is probably a little bit big for 155, and he's a little bit too small for 170. Or if that's that's just my own opinion. If there was a you know that 70 that weird 73 kilos thing that's going around at the minute, what the, what are they calling the fucking Light welter weight or so I don't know some super, crap. super lightweight I think super like, lightweight, an amateur yeah. super lightweight. I think weight, that yeah. would sue yeah. Oban down to the fucking ground if he if he could get in at that way. I think James is a big welter weight. He, he does get he gets up into the nineties when he's and not by any means fat. The man walks around about sub ten percent body fat constantly. That's why I hate James. If anyone wants to know, um, <laughs> but I think he's a big welter weight. A big welterweight with a lot of power. Um, but still, if, uh, um, uh, technique for technique, I think the two boys are they're pretty good at what they do. Um, and that game is fuck. I think that will be... I think, oh, yeah, it, it, I'm probably being biased here, but it's my fight tonight. It is my pick of fight tonight. Um, and, I, well, I think it's a toss-up between that and see how the, the wall-head uh, Reese fight goes. I think that could be a, a, another cracker as well. So, but I do think uh, Alban and James is going to be fighting tonight. Hundred percent. I bet, I don't. Sorry to hijack it, lads. Come in whenever you want. Obviously, Adam Darby is coming in in a completely different kind of a scenario than James. He's starting his career. He's coming off a lock, knockout loss as well. What kind of help and advice are you giving him coming into this? Because anyone can go in there and get caught at any given time, and that's what happened. He got caught early, maybe. Uh, you just keep your fucking chin down you. and your hands up. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> look at, look at. It happens. It's happened me in fights before. They've got knocked out, and for that one, for Adam, I think he was caught cold. A little bit, a little bit of that, and I think he got caught up, caught up in himself. Um, he was just trying to do be somebody that he wasn't in there. He's not that. He's not. If you want to look at Adam. And you talk to Adam outside in, in, in his persona, outside sort of the ring and MMA and whatever, all that. He's the nicest, humblest guy you'll ever meet. He's well-spoken. He's fucking half posh, if you, if you ask me, like, and, and I'll tell him that. And I just think he was trying to be something a little bit that he wasn't in there. He was trying to give, uh, yeah, man, what's a man's name? The, the, his nickname? Mush Aslani, was Mush, it? Mush, yeah. He was trying to give him the evil eyes and the stare down and this and something that Adam doesn't really do. Adam just goes out and everyone, he's, he's real unassuming. Then he goes out and wraps a triangle on you or he wraps his shin around the side of your face. And I think that's that's the Adam you want to be pushing out in there where people think, I'm going to walk through him for a shortcut. And I just, I, think, I just, that wasn't the Adam that everyone knows or, or that we know in the gym. So um, I have to say for, for the whole camp, the man has been putting in work. So say whatever you want about people getting knocked out in, in fights or whatever. It's whatever way you get. It, it's whatever way you bounce back from one of them losses. It's easy to take one of them knockouts. So every, you know, every, everyone gets fucking knocked out. Or, well, a lot of us get knocked out, anyways, especially in MMA. But it's whatever way you come back from them fights. And I have to say, he's been he's thrown his hat and soul into this camp. He's sparring the big the big lads, James Graham, Shane. Um, he's up the own extra walk up in DCA. Up with uh, Collie Matten and um, those boys up there. So 
He's actually point, he's at the point on a little bit of timber. He's walking with a strength and conditioning coach that he, he picked up with over in uh, Dubai, Ian Smith. And I think he's at the point on a couple of pounds of muscle. And I do think he's, if his head is screwed on, I think he's, it'll see the real Adam Darby in there because he's a fucking nightmare to spar, wrestle, get submissions on the gym. You know, even I find him fucking tricky, um, to, you know, to grapple with. Um, so, yeah, I think you'll see the best of Adam Darby in there. They're even having yeah, lads coming coming at him with knives and everything ahead of this fight as well. <laughs> to fend them off. <laughs> that was what that was. <laughs> uh, stop it. Stop. <laughs> Look, it's it's a big time for, for Rhino. It seems like there's a bit of momentum gaining again with Rhino. Um, obviously, a few lads on the card. Solomon Simon stepping big in. Big bad for, Saul. Saul for is going to be up for manslaughter charges on Saturday. Okay. I think, okay. I think I think, uh, I, straight, I, think uh, I think Simon's going to uh Saad's gonna do a number on uh on this kid. I do I do like that other kid he, he seems to be game as fuck. I lo- uh, it's good that this is at one forty five, is it? Yeah. Yeah, and even when even when he fought Adam, I said he's not a fifty five and I think that was at a catch weight of about seventy two kilos. If he fought Adam at, and your man walked in on the scales for a catchweight at one forty, a one fifty three, I think he, he he tipped on the scales, and um, so he was never a fifty five. But I do think uh, same with Saul. Um, the man comes up from Waterford every day of the week. Uh, trains with is in is in training with Big James Shane, and that he's going hell for leather with them boys and him and Adam and um, James is younger but Graham who's actually bigger than all of them. Um, hmm. uh, it's Saul's putting in the fucking walk and he's travelling up and down and he's, he's doing his walk as well he walks outside same with James same with Adam um, and they're just they're all grafters and I, but you know what I fucking love I love it that they're just grafters you know yeah like it, it seems like it's a do, do you agree that this is an important night for a team right now like to be honest I get sick of asking this question to the, the same different gyms and because there's so don't much separation bad, so don't ask it then. <laughs> that's a fair point that's a fair money point man, money boy money boy <laughs> <in there, buddy. laughs> <laughs> like, look SBG has Bellator uh, KF FAI Team Rhino um, are aligned with Cage Wars that's the way it looks from the outside in right um, so the reason why I like that uh, but the reason why I like Cage Warriors being back is whatever about Bellator me being on it and whatever you know I don't I, I wouldn't say I was the token Irish or the token out, guy outside um, SBG to be on it because I, I think I, I earned my place to be on Bellator um, but I think I was probably the only guy not drafted in to fight in SBG and Irish, I think I was the only Irish guy not to be drafted in to fight an SBG guy on Bellator card it's a fair statement yeah yeah so that, yeah I, I, I think it's a fair enough statement um, but that's the reason why I like Cage Warriors um, being back and not because I do little bits on the side with them now like commentary and stuff like that but you've just said it yourself the whole island and, and it, everyone gets a everyone gets a crack at Cage Warriors so if you're good enough and you know it doesn't matter what gym you come from or if you built up a little name or whatever they'll come they'll ask you to fight on the card and I think it's not so much even about a big night for Team Rhino, which it is. It's a big night for Irish MMA as a whole because there's Reese. He's the main event on it. Um, Kieran Lockland's getting a shout next week for another um, uh, title. Uh, Paul Lewis already holds a title. He, he's putting up cracking fights in as well. So I just think it's uh, it's a, it's good for Irish MMA as a whole to have Cage Warriors about. That's my opinion on it. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it, like there's a momentum building, um, as you mentioned there, especially when lads are winning titles and you look ahead and say, okay, well, you know, they they're they're probably the next guys that we're going to see in the UFC and hopefully uh, a new wave. You know, there was so much talk of the next wave coming after the the, the Connor era and uh, when thanks a while though, eh? you know, everybody everybody yeah. was expecting that straight away. Everyone everyone, oh, when's the next wave? When's the next wave? It takes takes time to for for stuff to like that to build. And Andy said a good one there a couple of years ago, um. It was say it was in England, and Kelbon had a load of guys in. Did Paul Sass, did uh, Terry Eaton, they had did a few guys in at the time, and it was their turn. So there was a couple of other English guys. Well, you know, English, England's a big, but it was Kelvin's time at, at that time. Then Connor got in, and, and that 
we had a little crack about as Ireland as a whole. Then there was a few from Scotland that went in, Stevie Ray, Joe, Joe, them. Then it moved back down to Liverpool, the few the next gen's gone in. So it comes around in circles, it comes, you know, swings and roundabouts. So it does take a little bit uh, time to come full circle. And I think now, only now you're getting the, the, the few that's going to go back in, the likes of uh, your Ian Gary's Reese's. And I do think James is going to win the title within the space of this year. And I do think it's... It's inevitable that James will be there. Um, I do think he's really he is good enough, and he, he certainly puts in the work. Um, and I do think the likes of Paul Lewis, them guys, I, I think it's inevitable that that they, that they'll go in as well. So uh, I do think it is coming full circle around now. Yeah, well, look, look, there's a huge fight coming up, uh, a huge fight card coming up this Saturday, 29th of April. Um, I'm just going just before we, we look, we could stay here for another hour and a half, I think, and, and unpack so much more with you, but we're not going <laughs> to make you do that with us. I don't know what. I'm just going to run through the card, right? Um, and get you to pick out maybe a few of the fights that you're most looking forward to outside of the Rhino guys. So we've got Kyle McClurkin from FAI taking an own with. I'm just going to run through them all first and then I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. jump in after. Uh, Alexandro Sullivan's taking on Afram Taki, so he's got a, a late notice of replacement there. Adam Shelley was originally scheduled to face Dean Barry, obviously. Um, oh, represent- that's controversial. We're not allowed to say his name on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go into that? <laughs> I agree, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'll go into it at the end, finish out the car for us and I'll, I'll have a little okay, chat there. Okay. I want to clear up some stuff. Okay, fair enough. So he's taking on, uh, Adam Shelley taking on Mohamed Kier, Ahmed, Ryan Curtis is back uh, taking on Nicolas LeBlanc. That's a, a you know, a, a tough opponent there. Uh, Solomon, obviously we talked about fighting Dorian Kalusnikov, uh, the Phantom MMA, Marcin Zembala, out uh, of Team Torres taking on Leon Hill, a great domestic matchup yeah. from, uh, from Team KF. Jack Tucker and Adam Darby, we've, we've already talked about. Paddy McCarry from FAI taking on Angus Hewitt. Taka Mandu from Team KF taking on Benoit Blanc. Then we got onto the main card. We've a heap of fights. Decky McAleenan dropping down to 145 to take on Wasi Adeshina. J- uh, James Sheen with fight we've already chatted about. Morgan Charrier, the, the last pirate from France, uh, mm-hmm. taking on Pedro Souza of Brazil. And then Ryan Shelley taking on Tobias Herrera in the co main event, followed by the champion, Reese McKee, defending his, uh, unifying his title, looking to, def- looking to unify it against interim champion J- J- Judo Jim Wallhead. Yeah. Loads of fights. What you make them? Yeah, pretty good. I think it's a it's a very very well balanced card top to bottom. And that's you know we always get them from Cage Warriors, get good fights uh, all down to Ian Dean really. Um, and his matchmaking skills, I think he pits the as good a uh, skill set as each other um, in, in fights. And that's what I think that's where you come across so good. And that's what, I think that's where you get the best fights out of Cage Warriors. Um, that there's never really lopsided fights in it. Um, looking forward to that. Uh, Shelley, can't remember which one, but it's Carilla. one. Ryan Carilla, Shelley, yes. Yeah, Ryan yeah, Carilla. that's a that's an interesting one. Um, who else? Let's see. Oh, the 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 Hill Macalena for you. Looking forward to that. Hill Zimbala. Oh, Zimbala. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Zambala, yeah, looking forward to that for you. Um, because the I think Wait, I think Zambala is four and two. Is he? Who or two and two maybe. Seven. He's seven and six right now, I think, but he's he's been on quite a good yeah, he's been on a good run though the last year or two as well. He's picked up three or four in a row coming in. He went four and one in twenty twenty two and he had that that head kick KO and everything. He'd really really be four and two the last a little bit. I remember seeing that four and one of of his of his last yeah. So in twenty twenty two. Yeah, he's on a bit of a streak. Yeah, that's right. And that kid Leon Hill's two and was he? No, he's a uh, four, four and I think, or four and one. Four and well, one, because yeah. he lost his he lost his debut on short notice, and then he had, he went four and zero last year with all finishes. I think Darby has a win over him somewhere in the they, So they maybe. fought, they fought against each other the last time Cage Warriors came to Dublin uh, when Carl Moore. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that? Yeah. What how did he win that for? It was a triangle. Uh, Darby won by decision. Decision, all right. Sorry. Um, yeah, looking really looking forward to that. Really looking for the the forward to the Shelly Harrell uh, for you. Um, who is who's the other Shelly fighting? He was fighting Dean Barry, and now he's not. So he's fighting. I'm laughing at you. He's fighting I mean, uh, Mohammed Kier Ahmed. Look, I mean, look, we're dancing around it here. Obviously, go on. I know he's going to ask me. Go on. Well, I don't know if you don't if, if you want to talk about it. I'll, I'll yeah, give a bollocks. That's the, uh, you, you, well, yeah. said you, want, you said you wanted yeah. to put some clarity right, so, on the situation. Yeah, I just wanted to clear up one or two little things. Of uh, I was on Twitter 
and I po- posted up some stuff after uh, underneath Andy's comments um, that Dane had pulled out. Everyone thought I was slating him. Everyone thought I was fucking just giving him shit for no, for, for no reason or whatever. And the truth is, I, I, I like Dane as a person. So I don't think there's any malice or anything in him. I just, whatever. Um, if I was giving Dane the time in the gym, no matter what he's asked me, between weight cuts that he hasn't listened to me for, uh, stuff to do in the gym that he doesn't listen to me for, uh, but he'll ask anyways, and I'll and I'll tell him regardless of if he does it or not. So that's what everyone. So I'll, I'll give anyone my time in the gym for whatever I know. It's probably not a lot, but I'll, I'll tell you what I do now. Same with Siri, same with Andy. We would walk with you if you want to walk. But I've heard. Or I had, sorry, I saw on his Instagram that he had put up that he had hold himself in wrestling practice. But I'd asked everyone in wrestling practice that that hadn't happened. Apparently it didn't. Apparently he walked out to his car fine. That's where it was at. So when I seen Andy had post up that he had pulled out for an injury that had happened in the gym, I just wanted to clarify that it didn't happen in the gym. Was I there? No. Am I going in the world of people? Yes. That's where I was at. Then I was being told then that on Twitter then that I was attacking a man while he's down and uh, I'm, a, I'm a worst of fire that I don't want to see anyone do well or, or, or that type of shit. Couldn't be further from the truth. My problem with anyone like that is I had, I did, I had one or two um, chats with him before via text because I'd never seen him in the gym through this whole camp. I think, he's, I think I've maybe seen him leaving the gym twice. Um, doesn't put the walk in. Leaves early. But he's forgot his gum shield every single time he's been in the gym or so he's, he's been told so he won't spar does, uh, he won't spar with headshots won't spar any of the good lads in the gym um, won't take your advice if you're telling him to cut weight I was told he was eating, he, he was telling me he was eating McDonald's when he was over and um, cutting weight to make to keep 77 kilos on him when he was fighting that guy in the UFC boy I'll never know so when you, you, yeah, you keep doing that type of stuff of course I'm going to get on your back. Of course I'm going to rag you. We would do that to anyone in the gym. And that's where my stance was on the whole thing. So, not, I, I never I never once called him anything. Never once said any name calling or this and that. And that's petty bollocks. I just put a few things straight that weren't, that that everybody thought wasn't. So, that's where I was at. Um, and I think, any good coach would do that. I used to get in the neck off Andy all the time if I was out having a drink and I'd be saying I'd be training. He'd, he'd ring me, say, you're not training, get the fuck up here now. So when I was doing it, uh, to Dan, I was being told that uh, why, why was I going hard on him and why was I this and that. So they're the little misconceptions I just wanted to clear up with everyone. That I would do it to anyone in the gym and I do do it to the younger lads in the gym when they're acting the bollocks. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, no, look, that that's fair enough, and I look, I appreciate you, yeah, being honest about it, really. Um, but look, sorry, sorry, Andy, just to cut across. Yeah. I think, as, as far as anyone knows me personally, I try not to fucking, or who, who has watched me talk on the microphone, or even about myself, or any of the lads in the gym. We try and be as honest as possible. I try not blow smoke up anyone's hole. I try not. Um, I, I just try and be as honest as possible and that's as honest as I can be in this whole thing. So that's where I was. And I felt bad for um, young Shelley, uh, but apparently they already had said it to Cage Warriors before that fight had ever been made to keep somebody on standby because they didn't think he'd make the fight. So when fighters, uh, when fighters uh, and teams are doing that for you, I'm taking, I'm taking a fight against you. Come on, pack it in, probably. So I, like, I guess... Just to to ask the question to play devil's advocate, um, as to what like why did you? Feel we don't, we don't know. We don't know if there's anything wrong with his elbow or not. He could have went home and bet himself around with a lump hammer. I will not know. <laughs> You'll not know. So yeah. that's that's where I'm at. There probably could be something wrong with, but it didn't happen at the gym, and I know that for a fact. Yeah, and so so, so someone might say, why did you feel the need to to come out and say that? Is it because like? Because I called anybody up, I called anyone yeah. up on it. If, if, if it was fucking Lewis Bourne in the gym and he was telling me he had something wrong with his foot that happened in the gym that didn't, I would say, you're a lying pox bottle, get the fuck back into the gym. Either that or you don't want to fight. So that's the way I'd say. So it's, a, it's accountability and it's, it's accountability you're, you're representing team right now. Young Jay Harris was around training with us from SBG um, 
Charlestown a, a little while ago. And the week before his fight, I think he was doing a few rounds or whoever, the week before his fight, he busts his whole head open across his eye. And like, uh, we used to do it to see it all the time before his fights. <laughs> He'd be going in for if someone had went in for a shot and he'd sprawled and he sprawled down his head, bust his whole head straight to the hospital, got fucking eight stitches in his forehead and went out and fought, fought the next day. Now, I know that's not, I know I pulled out fights with my elbows and stuff like that, so, but I quit. I quit when, when, when I started making, uh, having injuries that was, was, uh, that I wasn't making fights. I pulled the plug. I says, now, some, how many fights has Dan not made? But I, I told Andy when he was going off the, Florida at that time. I said, he's not fight over there. She said, no, I'm we. He's a million miles from me. Said he'd done his way cool. Then he went into um, rehydration team. He was ended up in hospital. Can I, I can't verify if that's true or not. But I told Andy weeks beforehand, he won't make the fight. I didn't even think he was going to make this fight because I never even seen him in the gym. So I would pull any of the young up in the gym if they were like that. And that's not, that's not me being, that's what I was saying. It wasn't a me versus Dean thing. It's a me race. It's a me calling out any crap in the gym that I just don't. That that's not honest or anything, you know. Hundred percent. I think it's fair for you to say that and and to clarify that as well because look, at lots of things can be misconcepted online and stuff like that. So I think it's it's well within your right to think that way and speak that way, Paul. Before we let you go, we'll finish on a more of a positive note because we do have a bunch of fighters that are showing up on Saturday. You've yeah. been involved with. Very special cage warrior shows through the years. You yeah. know, you're in the Helix, you won in the Helix, you've experienced what a cage warrior show is like in Ireland, and they're always a special occasion. Yeah. With Bama, with Bama, you had the chance also to compete in the three arena. Now we're combining the two together on Saturday night. Can you share what your experience was being a part of those shows and what, like, we'll see from, look, a viewing perspective and everything like that, and the fans will be there to get the live view. What's it like for a fighter? How good is it to feed off the crowd in Ireland? Did you like to feed off the crowd, and did you kind of take it as Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a big thing that, I, I, throughout all my fights and that, I, I, I used to think it was a big deal. I, I, would, only, I would only always ever listen, try and listen to me corner. And you, you would hear that you would hear your corner more so over the crowd. It's a, it's the crowd is just sort of a, a just a wave of noise really, and you're just hearing your, you know the Rick's Mandy or Siri in your in your ear, calling combinations or whatever. But well, when you will hear the crowd is if you're in a bad spot and you're fighting somebody that's f- from the UK or something or, you know or abroad, and I'd say I, I, I remember in I remember being in the guillotine. In Bellator for my debut, and it was a, it was, the stadium was only half full because whatever I t- took the fight in a week's notice, as usual, and uh, they put me on the, the first fight the whole night. So the, the crowd was only half in by that stage, but it was the first round, and I remember getting caught in the guillotine about tw- tw- 20, 30 seconds in, and the the, the man had the choke on the fence for four and a half minutes on my neck, and I fucking even though my two ears were bleeding blocked, I heard every one of them fans just don't tap, don't fucking tap your gun. Oh well, we got out, but they will help you out on the night. Um, but I think the three arena as a whole, if you're a fighter, it's huge. It, 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 regardless of the fight or whatever it is, when their career is finished, said all done, and it's over. It's the stuff you tell your grandkids. It's the stuff you tell your, you know, whoever listened to it when they're retired and say, that fucking agent never fought in the tree arena. You'll know you did and you'll be able to tell them your experiences down there. And it, it, it's, it's, an, it's an experience that you will take to the grave, which I'm, I'm glad I got to do it more than a couple of times. So I think uh, it, it, it is a big uh, deal for all the fighters on the night, especially if they're doing it the first time. I think a couple of the lads, the likes of Leon Hill and Adam and James, they've already experienced it down the tree arena. So, when you do it the first time, it, it was such a big show like that. The nerves go up a touch, even if you are used to like the likes of a regular cage warrior show, and that now you're fighting in front of five thousand home fans. So, um, the, the lads will definitely see it down there, you know. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm I'm buzzing for it. That's a it's a great way to kind of put a bow on it there. Um, look, before we let you go, I have to ask. We yeah. we had James Jimbo Slice Sheen on this podcast. Oh, I not hate the goods. I oh, hate the yeah. man's goods. He just walks around like a sub eight percent body fat all the time with his Pokemon bag wrapped over his shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, he's he's a, he's an interesting character, both inside I like and him. outside. I do like him a lot. Um, he kissed a man. He kissed a man as he was beating him up. Did you see? That I saw. Yeah, I saw the clip. He's he's a raging homosexual. I don't know if we can say that on the show. I don't know if we get like backlash off it, but I I do think he's a rage and something. Rage and Cage and James Sheen. <laughs> <laughs> That could Did be his next stick nickname. in the gym after that one. <laughs> <laughs> Did he get much stick in the gym after that one? No, well, very little. Like, look, you're rolling around with men on the floor, anyways, in, in barely next to nothing, anyways. There's not really much people can say, say regardless. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it, was brilliant. it was brilliant. Well, look, Redzer, appreciate time. I appreciate the honesty. Um, you always you call it as it is. Um, so you've, I feel like you've done that throughout your career. That's why they call me the Dublin Shot Caller. That's why I'm down in round for Cage Warriors. They call, they call the you what now? The Dublin Shot Caller. Like the whole of Dublin Caller. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, before I let you go, I want that. You're like, obviously, you're into the DJing and stuff. What's your, yeah. go, what's your go-to banger? That Jeremy, you know Jeremy that's Corey, Space Cowboy. Go but, put, it, put it on. The David Morales remix and you will have the time of your life for the rest of the night. Love it. I'm going to put it on straight away after this interview now. <laughs> Lovely. Right. Well, look nice on Paul. Appreciate the time. Um, we'll tune in uh, to hear your beautiful voice on Cage Warriors 154 in Rome. Uh, uh, we'll see Caitlin Nochran fighting for a title. I think no, Cage Warriors no, against no, subtitles I'm underneath the from my Dublin accent uh, over there. So I don't understand. Yeah. Actually, hang on a second. I can't believe you're trying to claim that you came up with Dagestani handcuffs. I did. I did. I did. Not, it was the. I didn't, did I didn't know. I think I didn't, never claimed I invented it. I was the first one that broadcasted it out loud on okay. a on a streaming service. So you can <laughs> thank me for that. <laughs> I, I, have more, I have more little one line phrases that I'm gonna let loose on this one. I keep stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can hit up uh, Jared Harris for some tips on uh, the the high octane moves or whatever he says. He knows. Oh, he knows. He knows. All right, well, look, Reds, I appreciate the time. Uh, thanks a million. We kept you like twice as long as we said we would. No, but uh, no, but I know he's always want to keep me for a fucking yeah, two hours <laughs> because I'm the crack. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on. We'll get no, you again soon. Yeah, there, lads. Oh, thanks, Reds. Cheers. Bye, 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 bye. Excellent. Always great to hear from Paul Redmond. Fantastic interview there. It's great to see him in good spirits. Let's get tucked into the rest of these fights there quickly and just share any extra opinions, lads that um we want to. I'm going to just open the floor to you, Andy. Um what else are you looking forward to in this fight? When I look at this Cage Warriors card, obviously I said we have the 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 fights that have uh title kind of uh jeopardy on the line here with with the main event obviously with James with with uh, Ryan Shelley's fight as well. We have a couple of guys making their Cage Warriors debut. We have a couple of guys who are looking for somewhat of a career resurgence as, as well. You know, uh, Ryan Curtis is coming in there looking to try and get onto a win streak. Decky McAleenan, who I spoke to on Severe, is coming back. He's without a win in his last three. He's moving down to Federate as well. We've got Alexander O'Sullivan, who's coming in at 1-0 and with his Cage Warriors debut. Paddy McCurry coming back after his impressive display. There's lots and lots. Kyle McClurkin, um, you know, there's a bunch and bunch of different great fights and different storylines coming in. What's one that you're particularly looking forward to on this card? One I'm particularly looking forward to is a battle between two Irish fighters and Marcin Zambala and, and Leon Hill. Um, I just think it's brilliant matchmaking for me and Dean. I think it's a really great opportunity for both fighters. Um, I, I spoke with Leon. I, I didn't. It's unfortunate because like it's just it's just easier to get to Dublin gyms basically. So unfortunately, some of the the northern fighters uh, miss out on occasion on, on on interviews. But I think it's a brilliant one because I think Leon Hill has just looked so damn good and ferocious in in 2022 going 4-0 and uh, he spoke to me about you know dealing with concussions after you know having a pro debut being out of the sport through injury for a while and finally getting back back into action and he's just he's looked levels above the opponents he's had and and look being honest I think he he is like he was going into those fights levels above the opponents he was facing so he was he was putting them away with with relative ease um, and now he's facing a guy in Martin Zambala who you know he has some solid experience he has some great wins and and yeah he started off his his pro career on a on a slump but what a 2022 he's had going four and one. He had that that was it a switch kick head kick uh, knockout um, early on in the year, and, and and has really been 
just bouncing back well. Um, and so, and so from his perspective, then this is a, a brilliant opportunity to go in and take out a guy who's riding high four fight win streaks in a row and say, you know what, you've been fighting these guys on the Irish team, but you haven't fought me. You haven't fought a guy like me or, or, or with my caliber or my experience. Um, and they both get to do it in front of an Irish crowd in the three arena. Um, and, you know, I think Leon's already signed to, to, a, um, a, a a multi-fight contract. I don't think Marcin is so a great opportunity for Zimbala to get signed with a win here as well. And it's a special night for Team KF in general, Andy, as well. You know, four fighters competing, obviously the Shetty brothers, Takamandu, and as you just mentioned there, Leon Hill as well. You know, they've been sharing pictures, they've been putting in the work, and it could result in a really, really successful night and a kind of, uh, you know, Sharon, I, I, what I like about this kind of Team KF story is, is that it's similar to what we've seen before. And, you know, even Chris Fields himself would have been involved in that rise through Cage Warriors with his teammates. And it seems like him as a coach, maybe you can tell me different, he's trying to recreate that again with some of the, the athletes in his gym right now. And this kind of seems like it's the start of it in certain ways. Obviously, we've seen... Uh, the lads fighting cage warriors before, but to have four fighters from your gym on one card it, it is a rare occurrence. Obviously, an amateur, you can have that, but on a professional side of things, it, it, we don't see it all too often outside of maybe some of the SBG uh, fighters on Bellator. Yeah, I, I think you've nailed it there. I think that's exactly what he's trying to recreate is the early days of SBG Ireland when when the likes of himself and Philip Mulpeter and Ashling Daly and Paddy Hoolan and Conor McGregor and, and, and Carl Pendrick were all coming up together. Um, I think that's what that's kind of the ethos and the the approach that he takes with the gym. And we had him on the podcast a, a, a long time ago at this point. Um, and he was talking about wanting to create that GAA, GAA atmosphere of, of a guy club. Um, so yeah, I, I think you don't have much else to say. I think you nailed it with that. I think that's exactly what he's trying to do. Last but not least, before I move it over to you, Quill show with you, Andy, Adam Shelley does have a new opponent. We kind of alluded to the fact with Paul Redmond, obviously he was originally slated, to take on Dean Barry uh, on the card. Dean Barry had to pull out, but we do have an insertion of a new fighter. It's great to see Adam get in a fight. Um, you know, obviously not the ideal kind of preparation, but ultimately it's good to see him getting matched up and share the information with us, Andy. Yeah, so he's fighting a Greek fighter called Mohamed Kir Ahmed, the, the Thracian or Thracian gladiator. Um, look, he's two and four, so I, I don't know a whole lot about him. He's, he's fought on Brave. Um, he lost that fight. Um, but yeah, he's, he's been active. Like I'm seeing, he's he's got, what, one, two, three, four, about four or five fights in the last year. Um, so yeah, look, late notice replacement. I imagine Ian Dean was probably scrambling here to, to find someone to, to keep Adam on the card. So um, yeah, I, I don't know too much about him, but I think the, really the main thing here was just kind of keeping Adam on the card. Yeah, 100%. I'm glad that Adam is on the card. Plenty more on the card, Quilcha, as well. And another fighter that has had an opponent change is that of Alexander O'Sullivan, who now comes in and takes on uh, Afrim Takwi. I hope that I got that right. Um, He will take on... Uh, yeah, so uh, since we talked to Alexander on the last... Uh, on the last show, obviously, Tom Wright, who is his original opponent, has been forced to pull out with injury. Afrim Takwi is his new opponent. But look at... we. I'm excited to see Alexander getting in there. I think he painted the picture for us perfectly on the last episode of the Old Triangle Quilcha of the accumulation of hard work that he's gone through to get to this moment here. And I think that he's getting the right scenario, the right scene. And I'm glad that you look at the last minute pullouts, they happen. I'm glad he's been matched and he gets the opportunity to come in here and showcase his abilities as well. Very much so. He's getting a, a good opponent as well, you know, uh, I was looking through Afrim's record. I've probably seen him compete, and I just can't remember him. Um, Norwegian lad, eight and three amateur record. Probably a few other fights re uh, regionally that aren't recorded. But um, yeah, like young, he's still a young lad, twenty six. Nice, get basically it's good to get an opponent. That's not a that looks like he could be very decent, really. And uh, but for Alexander, you know, he's leading the line there for CMAC. Um, he's leading by example, but at the front trying to show these lads you can get to cage warriors, you can start building your career there and then hopefully push on further. It was, it's fantastic. He managed to keep him on the card. It's a shame that Tom Wright fight never kind of, there isn't going to happen maybe another time down the line that I think it would have been fantastic. But the main thing is he's on the card and uh, it's a huge opportunity for himself and the gym because uh, it could be the start of something very special for both himself and the gym if with the win here. 
Yeah, hundred percent. There's also on the card we have a trio of fighters who are going to be representing FAI uh, up north as well. Kyle McClurkin, Decky Mac, uh, or not Decky McLean, excuse me, Ryan Curtis, and also Paddy McCurry. Um, you know, I'm excited to see all three fighters. I'm excited to see Kyle McLaughlin. Obviously, he had a couple of fights pull out. He's coming back in against Owen Williams. Ryan Curtis is is coming back and fighting in Ireland as well. He takes on Nicholas LeBlond. And Paddy McCurry goes in there against Angus Hewitt. Um, three separate interesting fights in their own right. Uh, any thoughts on any of the three of those fights? Just happy to see Kyle McGurkin finally got a fight. Um, it's been nearly three years. It's been three years since he's had a win, but like the last time we saw him in there was against Christian Leroy Duncan, I believe, and that was in 2020. So a lot, of, a lot has probably happened that time. And then we had the unfortunate circumstances where he, the John Redden fight, wasn't able to happen. And I, you know, he would have been upset about that. But now he finally gets his opportunity as an opponent and. Uh, a fight is finally in sight for him um, and one that is you know that's not against uh, Christian Leroy Duncan who ended up being uh, Cage Warriors champion so hopefully this can be the chance for him to uh, start building his career again inside the, under the Cage Warriors banner Yeah and like, uh, I, I know he lost I, I know he lost that fight as well but like, he didn't look in that first round he didn't look out of place against Leroy Duncan all things considered either no, no, not, not at all. all. Not at all. Pa- Andy, will Paddy McCurry be coming up the road, <laughs> down the road to, 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 to the tree arena? You had the chance to speak. Well, Paddy's with him. down the road, man. So he'll be he'll, he'll be heading road. down the road again to to Dublin. Uh, yeah, look at I. Let's talk about. I thought in defeat, uh, his defeat of James Wedd, he he looked excellent. He almost finished that fight. Like I mean, I think he gave a great interview with yourself ahead of the fight and. Um, you know, he explained the decision and taking that fight and, and some of the thoughts that came out of it. But he was damn near close to finishing that fight in round three. And, you know, the set of balls on him, to, be, to, to mm. there's no other way to say it, to come in and take on a, a fight like that so early in your career. You know, that's going to pay dividends to him. And like I've said it time and time again, there's different kind of spells in fighters' career. Obviously, the the wonders of going on an undefeated run is is always something that kind of draws attention to a fighter. What particularly interests me is the fight after a certain fighter has lost, where they reevaluate things, where they put things into perspective. And this, for me, makes me excited to see Paddy McCurry coming in here. And I, to be honest, I, I don't like to go out too much on a limb, but I'm expecting Paddy to put on a real good, impressive performance here in this fight against Angus Hewitt. I am too. I am too. Um, I, I think when you look at, he's been working a lot with Reese McKee as well. And like, yeah, he is. He's one of these fighters where, um, when I when he speak when I I've only spoke to him once in an interview, but when he was speaking to me, I'm like, okay, I I I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any bullshit behind this. Like he, when he, what he was saying, he 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 was speaking with conviction. He seemed to believe every single word he was saying, and that's that's the the perception that I got of him. Um, I thought he looked great again. You know, in in the moments where he was uh, having success against James Webb, he looked he looked like a serious serious uh, a serious talent. Um, and as you said, like very very close to finishing a former Cage Warriors champion. Um, so early in your career, and I talked to him a little bit. But I, I was like, you know, is this a blessing in disguise? Like overall, could it be? And I think. Oh, I think in the long term it is. I genuinely think that if you know if he had gone and and knocked out James Webb or whatever, um, you're th- you're three fights into your career and now it's what do you fight for a title next? Um, I don't know. It, it could have been a little bit too quick. I think that there's a chance he goes in and just blows the doors off Angus Hewitt here. Um, I I, I rate Paddy McCurry. I think he's a, a very solid fighter. I don't know. Now I'm saying that, but I don't know. Angus, much about Angus Hewitt. I couldn't find a whole lot about Angus Hewitt when I went looking. Um, he, he, Macari has a lot to say about, about Angus Hewitt. Either. There's a, accusations of steroid use and all sorts, allegedly. Um, and not coming from me, that's coming from, from Macari in the interview. But um, but yeah, look, I'm excited to see him here. I think it's... Um, this is the rebound fight, right? This is this is the type of fighter he should be fighting three fights into his career. Uh but haven't had the experience of going in against a guy like James Webb, I think that'll seriously stand to him here. Hundred percent it will. Um Quilcha, Decky McAleenan's coming in here representing Team Torres. His first chance. I spoke with him uh, this past weekend. It's up on severemma.com if anyone wants to listen in. Um and it's his first time fighting in the three arena. He's 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 very excited for that. But you know, I think the focal point of our conversation was a guy who uh, we spoke about his career and not taking the easy route. 
and he never really has. And I think, you know, without a win in his last three fights, obviously a draw and two losses, he's been looking to kind of research uh, in the featherweight division here against Washi Ashinda. And I mean, it's still kind of the same kind of career trajectory where he's moving down to the featherweight, but he's also moving into one of the one of the most shit hot divisions in Cage Warriors right now as well. So kind of had a little bit of a giggle like that, even though he knows he's never taken the hardest fights, but yet he's still kind of inserting himself into difficult situations. But I'm expecting to see a strong, hungry Deki McAleenan in the featherweight division. Um, are you looking forward to seeing him compete? And what are you expecting to see, Quilcha? Yeah, I always enjoy watching Decky compete. Um, I was at the last fight in London where he lost to Tobias. Um, but uh, he looked a little bit outsized in that one. Tobias actually looked huge for a guy who actually for fights at a uh, featherweight. Um, so it's good to see Decky come down to the uh, featherweight division and see how he gets on there. Um, Wasi, I we actually watched him at FCR. He fought against Glenn McVie. Yeah. That's um right. it was the it was the fight where he just came out and wrestled to be honest he wrestled for the entire thing and he'd very very strong wrestler uh so personally i'd be looking at this thinking okay he's gonna probably come out with the same game plan of try and just get a hold of decky bring him down to the mat and try and try and win it there so what i'd be expecting is for decky to utilize that striking because we know he's very good in the feet we know he's also a very good grappler so to avoid that strength, they saw Wassi was very strong on the ground. I'd love to see him strike in this one and potentially take him out in the feet and make a big statement in the featherweight division on his like return or is it his debut in the featherweight? Correct me if I'm wrong. Return, he's, return, return. He's, he's, yeah, he's fought there already. I think yeah, he's he's been there last fought there 2019, I guess. Against, against, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Strangely enough, you said that about the striking. It'll be interesting to see what happens. He does. He was kind of given out to himself on the interview for for maybe being a little bit too stubborn and want to just strike and fight. So he's excited to kind of showcase his grappling in this fight as well. And I know someone else who's looking and excited to showcase their abilities, last but not least, Andy, is Takamandu, who you spoke to as well, um, who signed with Cage Warriors quite some time ago. Uh, but this is the first time we're going to see him. We've talked about a couple of, of out of the cage stuff that was kind of hindering his training and his progress, but he's found a newfound dedication there. And you know, I think we've seen flashes of brilliance from Taka, but we've not seen that full, perfect performance just yet so far in his professional career. And I'm very excited to see what he does here against ben, uh, Benoit Blanc. Um, and I think he looks in phenomenal shape. He seems mm-hmm. in a very good mindset right now. And that's a dangerous combination, obviously, for, for a fighter, a good combination to have to bring into a fight. What are you expecting to see from the cat coming in here uh, at Cage Warriors? Yeah, I mean, I, if if Jesus, <laughs> if his physique is anything to go by coming into this one, he's he's definitely prepared. Um, but my God, um, when I, when I, so I went and visited KF and I interviewed a few of the lads and like, Chris was, was he was kind of just pointing out, he's like just just watch Taka and like just he is he is going to show out uh you know in, in this fight against Benoit Blanc he looked very crisp uh, they talk about in, in the gym they talk about his power like it's kind of like it kind of reminds me of how people used to talk about like the Reese McKee jab like the kind of that touch of death um now it remains to be seen Reese has, has, has proved that in his fights it remains to be seen if if Ta- uh, Taka will show that um but that's kind of the, the talk is in, in a similar vein and, and yeah like he, he spoke to me about kind of i guess regaining i don't know if motivation is the right word but it, it almost seemed to me like a purpose uh like why am i doing this like i'm I, and like like am i ready it, there was kind of a mental struggle of sorts there for taka where he was talking about you know he was his father unfortunately passed away when he was younger and, and he was kind of doing it for for him uh whereas now he's like you know what no I'm i'm ready for this i'm ready for the interviews i'm ready for the spotlight um I'm ready to to go on a run here and and try and get myself into a position where I can be calling for the UFC and it seems like that's what he wanted a year ago but then there was some sort of dilemma of you know maybe a mental I don't know exactly but there's some sort of mental struggle there um but it sounds like he's in flying form these days um but yeah so I'm, I'm excited to look I'm just excited to see him back in there and, and see what he can do and he's got a, a good opponent against Benoit Blanc so we shall see 100% Is that Benoit he... Blanc from Knives Out yeah <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's seen the movie and get the reference 
I know I know Taka was likening himself to a pint of Guinness before. It's like a pint of Guinness zero now because there's zero body <laughs> fat on that man. <laughs> it's like it's a. a can I Go just ahead. jump in? Sorry, this I I I wanted to do this. Just I know I know we've passed by Decky McAleenan's fight, but I just have to say this. Anyone listening to this, like I'm, I really am excited to see Decky McAleenan back at one forty five, and he has fought there in cage wars before. But I challenge anyone to go and look at Decky McAleenan's run on the Irish scene between 2017 and 2018 and find a better one. Find a better string of fights and finishes on the Irish domestic scene than that, because I haven't seen one in in God knows when. Um, and if he if Decky like sorry I just I, I it's all I can think of since he's been talking about it there but that Decky McLean and dropped to 145 it's it's making me think of that run and I'm getting excited and I hope he can find that resurgence 100% very well said um look at the Irish action doesn't end at Cage Warriors 153 because a week after that we've got Cage Warriors 154 and an Irishman topping the bill there as Caelan Loughran is going to prepare himself and is getting prepared to take on Dylan Hazan for the vacant bantamweight title all the way over in Rome. So he's going to try and take over in Italy, become the bantamweight title. We spoke with him earlier on in our uh, Ultra Angle tenure. He's back again ahead of this title fight. And I'm going to send it over to myself to get that interview kicked off. Caelan Loughran is back on the old Triangle podcast, right ahead of his Cage Warriors 154 title challenge. I guess it's not really a challenge. It's a vacant title now, I guess, against Dylan Hazan in Rome. We're just about a week and a half away, Caelan. Look at you were on with us, episode seven. We were just talking before you came on. Episode seven of the Owl Triangle. You're on there with your brother. You're sitting on the same couch that you're sitting on there. You said there's a lot more room over there at the minute. And that time it was all eyes on the cage warriors title and now we're just around the corner from making that happen um it's been a good interesting like you've always said this from day one and this is what i admire you your your kind of belief in yourself has shone through since the very early stages of your career and now you're on the cusp of becoming the cage warriors world title this was the plan all along and it's been a great journey so far how excited are you to kind of get in there uh, and compete in a couple of weeks time? We can break the fight down a little bit more, but just maybe has the camp been different? Um, what's the mentality like this time? Yeah, I know you're ready. You've been telling us every single day online, you're counting the days down. How are you feeling right now? Uh, I'm feeling like a world champion. <laughs> I was able to answer that day. Everybody's asked me the last like, 10 weeks, how are you feeling? I'm feeling like a world champion. Uh, the camp has been very different. Uh, five fives is a different beast. Preparing five fives is a different beast. I feel like fighting a Thai boxer and stuff like that, the fight might be hard, but the camp for an elite level wrestler is fucking grueling. Absolutely grueling. It has to be. I, uh, the, to be honest, the preparation for it is probably... It's probably given me like a newfound respect for the boys who are at the top of this sport, what it takes to get to the pinnacle. Because even last year talking to Terry Adam on a show fighter of our gym, well it was the first UFC fighter out of our gym and he's he telling me about whenever he's preparing for like buckles and these guys in the UFC, the camp that Collins put them through and you were comparing it to mine. So uh it's a completely different base preparing for five under Colin Hearn, but it's been very enjoyable. Uh fighting for the belt, of course it's it's class. It's, it's what I've been going for since the first time I've thrown a pair of gloves in me. I mean, it's this is this is it. This is why this is why I say with these words. This is what I, I told you was going to happen. Told every single person who would tell me this was, or would list anybody who would listen that this wasn't my level. But no, I'm excited. And even those who wouldn't listen. <laughs> what? And even those who wouldn't listen. Yeah, yeah. I, I forced them to listen. <laughs> but like. First of all, maybe the elephant in the room. Uh, we were hoping that we'd get to see you in Dublin. I thought the occasion would have fitted this. Obviously, Cage Warriors are trying to to fill out their cards with title fights and everything like that. For us looking in, you know, maybe mm. a slight frustration, a, sla- a slight lack of understanding why you're not competing on the Dublin card, Cage Warriors 153, this coming weekend. But, yeah. you know, obviously you wanted that. It didn't materialize. like. What was kind of the conversation there? Were you pushing to be on that card? 
And and how did it kind of come to be that you ended up on the one five four in Rome just a week later? Yeah, well, I remember that show was announced, and I proposed me and Martin Reed, let's get this done, lad. We're obviously fighting in Dublin. I thought that was would have been the what would happen. Uh, I was then offered a fight with Martin Yoni in December of last year, and I accepted, obviously. But sorry, I was offered I could fight in Dublin for no title, or I could. They're doing a show in Rome. Didn't know what date it was going to be at, but they'll be going to Rome, and I would fight Martin Yoni for the main event. My career is more important than selling tickets in Dublin. I was thinking I'm fighting for a title, obviously. I accepted, and probably, when the fuck would it have been? I don't know. Uh, February, maybe. Found out that Martin Yoni wasn't taking it, and he was vacating. And immediately I thought, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be his hand. I didn't, because Colin goes, what do you think he's going to do? And, and I go, it's going to be his hand. He nodded said, it was 100% going to be his hand before we'd, we'd heard. So it just, uh, they wanted to stick, stay in Rome. Obviously, it would have been nice, but like, I don't know, lad. I think I'm the best fighter in this whole promotion. Start from bot, from one, two, five through the, I think I'm the number one fighter in cage wars. Obviously, this guy's been here longer and done more. But I have three fights this promotion. Uh, after fighting a so called cage wars champion, I do honestly believe pound for pound, me at 135 pounds is. I guess it's easy. I mark up the cage wars is easy. So I should be main event. That's how I see it in my head. I, I should be main event in the show now. So being on a co main event or something like that in Dublin, I'd rather be I'd rather be main in Rome. And here <laughs> look I'm taking I'm taking sixty odd people to Rome. Sixty odd between Ireland and Liverpool, I'm taking sixty odd people to Rome to fight for a cage wars title. You know what I mean? He can't he can't really put in negative. That's lethal, like it's not I don't I don't know if I'm negative twist and that all could be in Dublin. That's fucking that's living the dream, lads. So now it's yeah, that's okay. great to hear. You. It's great to hear you say that way and 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 have that attitude towards it as well. Like, I mean, yeah. The way you said it there, it, it paints a pretty picture. I mean, you're going over to Rome, lots of lots of Rocky battles Ford. between. <laughs> <Rocky Ford. laughs> yeah, I keep yeah. Watching the wee training, like, I'll keep watching the wee training thing on TikTok. <laughs> Uh, have you been Rocky chasing Ford. any chickens there in the preparation for this fight? No, or anything? no, no, fuck. <laughs> just wrestle, like fuck. Yeah. So look, at Martin only was supposed, to, obviously, he was the champion, and that was the original fight that was slated. Like, what was the what was the news that came across to you when that fight wasn't happening? When did you find out? And you know what? Uh, like, are you frustrated that you didn't? get the chance to take the title off him or, or how are you feeling about that whole situation obviously uh, Dylan Hazan has stepped up and he's going to be competing for the for the vacant title with you, you know, I have like a lot like, like a, making a documentary and the whole build up you know he's been here for like 11 weeks and he wasn't in that night I really wish he had been in that night I remember Colin told me it would have been deadly he uh, he told me to, I, sw- I literally bossed out laughing and I go no way because uh, I've been I've been trying to get on the party only for months like months i couldn't care less i i couldn't care less he was he won a vacant title again oh sorry he beat dom who i didn't really rate he had he come into it had he won a bantam it before he fought dominic like had he actually he'd won a flyweight he'd won it he had won a catch weight so again like, i couldn't actually believe that he got the title fight when he got the title fight against dom he had lost to nathan so i didn't i didn't I didn't think he was like some dominant champion. I couldn't. I couldn't care less. And uh, as soon as I heard it was going to be his on, I swear in my life, I think he's a way, way, way harder fight than Michelle Martignoni. Like how? Like Martignoni? Like how? He's he's wide open and really small. I sw- I swear on my family's life. I was. I said in this video, I was trying to convince myself when I was watching Martin Young, he's like, he's a cage warrior, he's champion, Keon, he's going to have something, and I would stick him on, I'd be like, he doesn't, this is, that, that could not trick my mind to thinking this was a hard fight, I literally couldn't, I could not, he was wide open, really small, could have took him down, finished him, never really rated him, I rated, I tell you, I rated his heart and his gameness until he pulled out, <laughs> but uh, Hazan, I don't need to trick my mind into thinking it's a hard fight, like he's, Wrestled internationally, wrestled in the world championships for Italy. He's nine and oh, never had a hard fight. So I'd be delusional to think that he hasn't got something I need to prepare for every day. You know what I mean? It's uh, 
a much a much harder fight than Martin Union, I think. Is there it, something special about going in and uh, into en- enemy territory here in Italy? You're you're a guy who seems to thrive off stirring the pot a bit. <laughs> For me, <laughs> uh, no, I okay, it's, it'll be good. Like uh, I was actually literally only today watching the uh, Italian event, the, how they booed Dominic on the way out and stuff. Uh, boo all you want, lads. It's not gonna work. <laughs> With um, with Dylan being such a heavy wrestler, I guess how good is it or comforting is it to have someone like Mike Grundy training you in wrestling, considering the level that he's competed at? He's literally just a better version of Dylan and everything. He would tack fall him in freestyle wrestling. He's bigger, faster, stronger. He's a more complete MMA game. He's literally, you talk about 11 week camp and it is, it's been very specific the last 11 weeks coming out of positions and Dylan's sequences and stuff, but it's been a four and a half year camp. I mean, my main training part has been Mike. Every day, round starting on the single leg, three, two, one, go. And now this camp is coming in fresh and stuff. What, like, watch this. I know it didn't work out for him in the UFC. It's, I don't know, frustrating probably, but like, watch the first round against Mozart Ibloy. Mozart's one of the number one prospects in the whole UFC. Watch the first round. Grundy come in, wrestle fucked him, tuck him down, almost darsed him. So if I have Mike coming in fresh on me, is that in the first round every round? <laughs> like he take a round off and come back on me, take a round off and come back on me. I have that first round against Mozart every round. It's a. Uh... There's one day I was training, right, about eight, six weeks ago, and I was going from striking round, I went for a striking round with Jacob Smith, who just fought Rod Times, one challenge of Thai boxer, to an MMA round with Mike. And they're rotating. And I, I don't think I know eight fights or something. And I literally turned around to Colin and goes, if I went to Sanford MMA, I wouldn't get better training than that. That was, that was unbelievable. I remember the first day we got, uh, I was, Mike wasn't training, he, had, he was sick or something. And I was training, and as I was training under Colin, Mike was watching his hands, was watching his you know, as I was training. And then the session came over and he went through Hazan's attacks, like his ABCs, wrote, like a lot of wrestlers have that, like DC would have went, he would have went, uh, head outside single, one round to the high cross, high cross didn't work, stuff that he went inside trip, really didn't deviate from that too much a day, a lot of wrestlers have this sequence, Mike has this sequence too, and after the session I sit down just dripping full of sweat and uh, we were just having a conversation about his attacks and everything and he was fighting him, me calling Mike and I said, I think this is, like I love the shit talk was in there. I love the moment. I love him, but this, this, this is what I love. And then this is like, we just started preparing, we started drilling, going through all his sequences, what he does, how he sets up his attacks. And I, I love, I love it. I absolutely love it. I love everything about preparing for these guys and then going in and and and, and executing it. But uh, Mike has been an elite level training partner. All the guys in Cowboy are his son Jack, is. Lad, if I was to tell you about a fucking phenom, 18 years old, like, I swear to God, when the time I lost 25, 26, you're talking, I don't know, Hamza Chumayev level, like, you're talking about a, a different level of fighter there at 18. He's getting a bit big for me now, I'm down like 70 kilos, he's up to 80, so I probably won't trim him now to the fight, but between the two of them and Colin, it's been, i say it's been very, it's been like, not going to lie, like, it's the days you wake up and you think like this is going to be, you're sore, you've had guys coming in, you're fresh every single day for rounds and rounds and rounds. They've obviously had not had the week that you've had, but come the Friday, they're going to be coming in fresh again. It fucks your mind up. It's hard every day. It's hard. It's a hard way to make a living, but I've loved it. I've absolutely loved it. And uh, you're going to see a different level. You're going to see a lad that's just simply not on Cage Wars level. 9 0 Dylan is. 9 0 coming in with an elite level wrestling background. Ragdolled everybody. Probably as tough a test you're ever going to get in Cage Wars for being realistic. How, how often does a fighter come through the UK scene or European scene maybe and have had the elite level wrestler test? It's quite rare. And I'm going to I'm gonna show you that if you if you want to see Keelan Arn in a hard fight, you're going to have to say in the UFC. And you're going to have to push him up the UFC quick because this is not my level. I even went up and around Sparn recently. Some big UK prospects, big UK names. I'm not a regional fighter. I'm going to show you in 13 days. 100%. Days. 
uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. We'll get maybe into the fight a little bit more and, and maybe what's next after that in a bit, Caelan. But I want to ask you, look, at you're a guy who moved over to Team k Bon as a teenager with, with all your dreams and all your aspirations. You yeah. went in, obviously, and told them that you wanted to be a world champion. They have guided you in the right direction. You're, you're, you're right on the doorstep of it now. What would it mean for you, look, with all the years of hard work that you've put in, all the years of hard work that went in, in with your teammates in the gym for you to bring back a world title into that gym? Oh, it'd be unbelievable. It'd be unbelievable. Uh, again, we're talking about last night, uh, we're at FCC and... and uh, Cause we've come together now with four corners, John Gillies, big striking coach. You may see him pad Liam Harrison and stuff, like big boss, a big striking coach. Our gym's formed with theirs, and they were talking about the uh, K1 days and pride. And there's a K1, a K1 Max tournament or something they're talking about. I don't even know what this is. It was apparently some massive thing back in the days over in Japan. Yeah, I remember them. Col- yeah. Colin won that is it, in K1 fucking, I don't know how long ago that was. Like, I don't even know. That's even before I, I don't even know what that is. And then John Gill, like we wouldn't be emotionally hating John Gill. He goes, "Fuck, you've done a lot, Colin, haven't you? Like that wouldn't be the comp. Like there wouldn't be them type of gays. You know what I mean? Colin's like, ah, oh, you can't pass it off. Not even mention them. Mays at ten gays in the UFC. If you take the most recent gays, Tom Aspin, all the until Mike Grundy, they've come from amateur. They started the, they're the first amateur fight with Colin through the UFC main event and stuff. But this would be the first like major." Um, no, I'm not saying Terry Adam or Till or something wouldn't want to bother or wouldn't want a Keys Wars title if they're in it, but this would be the first MMA big title, really. Obviously, Till fought for the UFC belt field. Uh, so now it'll be cool. It'll be it'll be uh, nice for me. No one calling he wants the UFC belt. Like, he doesn't give a fucking Keys Wars probably for me. It'll be cool to give it back to him. Like, yeah. Well, uh, that'll be it. I'd say that. <laughs> Caitlin, you, you put up a post there. Um, about about basically about lads or like kind of amateurs or young lads on the scene walking around Rolexes while you're kind of struggling to put petrol in your car and and <laughs> the reason I'm bringing it up as well because um Oban Elliott gave a fantastic interview with Sean Sheen just the other day on Severe and he was talking about you know the struggle of kind of like the amount of jobs he's had working on the railroad never been handed anything and when I think of you know you hear of yourself and your brother going over to Liverpool when you're teenagers and kind of leaving everything behind. And you kind of hear that, and it's like, oh yeah, they went, you know, they went over and started training, but you don't really see the day to day, um, or what goes in, and the the hard work and dedication. What has that been like for you? Like, do you feel like you've had to kind of claw and scrape, or or what's the overall experience been like? Yeah, well, the first ten and a half months I slept in the gym and Team Carbon, like, is like, literally no windows, we tiny we bunk beds, me above a Brazilian, but it was like fucking everyone's on top of each other. It was tight going, um. Then I'd go out working like a, I'd work in a bar and people would come home, people would come home, you know, or go over to Liverpool, obviously like a big stag new spot. And I'd work in an Irish bar and they'd be like, even this, I only stopped in the building of my face, but like I was doing like in January this year and I was like, fuck, I wouldn't have thought you'd be working here. You know, people think you're, people think you're flying, but like, ah, it's, it's, like, it's part of the game, I suppose. Um, there's no money in this. It takes a long time to make, to make, do uh but i i have i've always seen the bigger picture i've been delusional but even whenever i was an amateur when i shouldn't have thought i probably shouldn't have thought i'd make it this far or this far i need to focus started, but i wouldn't probably shouldn't have thought i'd be at the ufc champion stuff but i don't know for some reason i did and uh very soon i'm going to be in the ufc very 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 soon i'm going to be one of the biggest stars in european mma and I believe that it'll, uh, it'll all be worth it. It's, uh, it's a tough way to make a living, especially come to a gym like our gym. There's a lot of fake fighters. And the same people you talk shit with me and you say, like, uh, can you see that dog? Uh-huh. Yeah, we can, you can hear this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I live next door to these fucking absolute, this sort of ruined my life. They smoke weed all the so annoying. <laughs> Uh, I, when I was coming up, like if I used to always like, because I was always when I was struggling to get matched in the races and stuff, people used to, I didn't give a fuck about anyone, but they used to imply like I was some sort of like fake, like not a real fighter. And that just used to think this annoy me, because like, the way I trained, like you fucking do it, like sitting up on Instagram, hitting a 50 punch combo and then going and chilling, 
or a nice wee light morning S and C session. The way I train is different. The way my gym trains is different. So that's probably the only thing. Uh, I'm a real fighter. I train as hard as I possibly can, and I'm soon I'm going to be at the top. That's the fight on the last say. How do you think Dylan is going to come in and uh, kind of deal with your kind of presence in the cage, your pressure in the cage? You know, yeah. you don't think he, he can't at all. You you, yeah. you you see no way that he's going to be able to get to you, Nick, uh, a cage where you're on 53. Absolutely no chance. If you watched his last fight against uh, Bro, against that boy who's 40 years old, two and two, in the room show. At this level, it's not just cracking the jab. This level is not drilling the fucking intricacies of a doors choke. It's how you deal with them moments. It's how you deal with the crowd. It's how you deal with everything. And 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 as with all his rest and accolades, I watched his last fight. Lad, he came out like a fucking I don't know, like an he fights like an ape. Like he comes out like a madman. If you do that against me, there is don't even show up. There is no point. There's no point. I'm just gonna ride you. I'm definitely gonna finish it. And I can say this openly, and you can tag him underneath this because what's he gonna do? Come out and have a slow tactical fight, man. Pull him away in three minutes. He can't. He cannot deal with that. He he comes out like an absolute nut job. Tries to chain like even Hamza comes out a uh, very reckless. I think he'd probably learn off the give up. He comes out very aggressive. But he's a back player and puts jiu-jitsu with it and is a finisher. He's got chokes, grinding pounds. I think Dylan doesn't try to do that. He just tries to string these two together. So you're going to come off from 125 pounds like an absolute lunatic and try to do that to me 25 minutes. I don't know, lad. I don't like your chances. I don't like your chances. Uh, see, uh, when you get to this level, it's like this last bit, the physical's almost done. It becomes with the mental. And like, I rate you on that as much as I rate your fucking backhand as much as I rate your leg kick as much as I rate your every this this that's a massive factor when you're fighting me especially over five and I in that area like I give him all the respects his wrestling is unbelievable if he came into the gym I'm sure he'd be very very hard round but over five fives I don't know that I don't uh, I don't give you a chance of surviving it's <laughs> the truth you say five fives. Do you expect it to go that long? Are you looking to go out there and make a statement and, and finish the fight early? Or are you just kind of wait to see what happens? You don't mind either what way it goes? Uh, fighting's hard. So, like, I know that. I am anticipating a, a late finish because of how he fights and just his approach and uh, how I've been preparing. I think, I think. If you watch the Shanks fight, you watch the first fight, the only way they didn't get KO'd was because I've tucked them down and finished them on the mat. That's the only way I see him surviving, getting a clean boxing KO's. If I scramble the top position, I'll get them. Because a lot of elite level wrestlers, especially ones who train in the gym like Dylan, like how often is he in a bad position? Honestly, in the gym, how often is he not on top? How often? He's probably most times he's going to be on top and he- holding guys down. So a lot of wrestlers, a la Justin Gaethje, will almost neglect jiu-jitsu. Oh, they won't take me down. I'll never be there. But if he hasn't spent the last, I don't know, he's doing them every five years. If he hasn't spent the last five years putting himself in them bad positions, doing the basics, shrimping out of position, escaping back, escaping knees, if you haven't done that every fucking day for the last five or so years because he hasn't done them that long, if he hasn't been putting himself in these positions and doing the basics, getting out of these then by all means, lad, come try and wrestle. If I hit top position once, you're dead. It's too late now. You won't. You won't just. You can't just start escaping back when you're fighting me. Ten weeks out of my fight, you can't do it. It's just too late. You're you're fucked. I'm too good on my positions to to escape them. Don't care who you are. Again, I've been up training with top guys in the UK. When I hit these positions, it ends every time. Every fucking time. It never. I buried with, between fighting and sparring. I buried four hundred men. From them position so if he hasn't been putting himself in these positions he's done it's no point he's they're done and then if you look at the striking i'm smart enough to know that i'll have to go through a high level relentless wrestling attack to get a, K- a ko i know that it's gonna have to do a lot of grappling to make it a boxing but if it is i look at the way he swings right hands over the top like i've seen better technique at 3 a.m i'd say night clubs honestly he swings he nearly hits the fucking lights if you can't get me down and it becomes that, like I don't even think, you, like I've, the strikers in our gym, he wouldn't even be used for a round. 
So I do rules wrestling. I am smart enough to know that nobody has been fit to make it in the MMA fight because he's so good at wrestling. But that only works to a certain level. That'll work in Europe. That'll work in cage wars, no problem. But as I said, I don't see myself as cage wars level. I swear on my family's life, I went through the UFC top five, top ten, and I believe from the bottom of my soul I could finish every single one of them right now. I know that if Aljo got my back, he'd finish me. I know Pewter could knock me out. I know them all. I know they could finish me, but I know I could finish them. I know if I hit my position, it's done. I know if I put a clean shot in your chin, it's done. I'm watching fucking Marlon Cheeto Vera being announced as the number three bantamweight in the world. You could not, there's nothing you could say to convince me that he's better than me. Right now, you could not convince me. At anything, at any part of MMA, he's the number three. Sean O'Malley's number one contender. I don't know, you give me 10, 11 weeks to prepare for these guys on the con her and I'm going to be walking the cage with no doubt I'm going to win. I, uh, I know Dylan's good. I expect him to have his moments because he is good. He's going to have his moments. I just think it might go from him having his moments to my moment just ending it like that. So I probably late, but I think it's uh, if you know anything about fighting and you're watching it as, as it's happening, you'll know what way it's going from the first second. If he approaches it the way he always approaches it, that is, you know. Caelan, I'm gonna read you. I'm gonna read you out a tweet from yourself on the 14th of April. Um, look, you've referred to to Dylan as a as an elite level wrestler. Um, you tweeted, I can't wait to see the look on Hazan's face the first time he feels my hips on the cage and realize for the first time he's in a 25 minute MMA fight. The wee bastard's heart will sprint out of his ass. Is it your, is that what you're saying? Is it your wrestling that you think is going to be the surprise package considering he's such a top level wrestler? 100%. Yes, people think that I'm a take you down, take your back, back for And I, I am that. But the main, the main, my favorite, my best thing is guys who want to try and hold me down. I'm just, you know, I don't know. It's just, uh, that's my best day. The guy who has to take me down, hold me down, and can't strike me. That's that's my style. That's the, that's what I want to fight. Uh, I'm telling you, he, he won't hold me down. He may get me down. He's got. He's very creative with his uh, scrambles. It's like I remember, like two years ago, sending this, like sending the call. I've seen this weekend in cage wars. Like the way, like inside trips from behind. It's like rare. It's very, very. It's a creative. It's also very flexible. There's duck outs and stuff. It's nice what he does. But I'm on to it. And that's it. He's got one game. And he's going to find out very, very, very early that I'm very, 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 very good in the getting wrestlers now. Very good at the getting wrestlers. So uh, I say, the wee man's heart's going to sprint out of his ass. <laughs> so if it all goes to plan for you, Caelan, um, you're getting the belt wrapped around your waist. Uh, and you're thinking about what's next and the options that you'll have will be quite a few really after the fact i mean you know you're okay if you're a cage warriors world title i mean you do have the avenue to the ufc uh you have a show in july in london we have a cage warrior show that's coming back to dublin later on this year in november i mean i know you're a man who likes to probably tick off a few uh, little goals you know are you looking at the ufc next would you like to maybe take off a title defense in Dublin, maybe headline a, a cage warrior show there later on this year before you make that happen? You know, I think you stay going on the trajectory that you're going to be going. I think there's no doubt we see you in the UFC sooner rather than later. What's your perfect scenario? Obviously, if you go in there and get the win, what would you like to do next yourself? Uh, I want to say with the UFC the next the next day if I can to be honest with you I always say I go through cage wars I want to defend the belt and all this here but I just I say I can't what's the point here you know, Cheeto Vera is number three in the world like what what the fuck is the hold up what is the hold up honestly what is the hold up he's not good he's not good at MMA I want to say him the UFC um, people are like always say like oh I don't want to do the contender series and stuff like this here like I would do the contender series within reason like I'm not fighting that fucking 21 no Russian out of it, you know what I mean? If the fight's right, the fight's right, you know what I mean? Like, I know people say you get like stuck contractually, but I don't think it's gonna take me too long to get a new contract in the USC. Uh, so I'd probably do that. I, I'm not even listening to all these guys in the cage wars division to keep saying my name. Like, as soon as they come out of the cage, they're screaming my name. I was like, I don't even give a shit about it. I couldn't care less. If I have to defend it, I have to defend it. None of them, I don't care who it is, I don't care, they're, 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 I don't care about them. I want to say in the UFC, obviously straight in, I have to do contender series, absolutely no problem. I've backed myself to finish these guys, 
like I see them like the Latino guys in around like Combache and LFA. Like I always feel they're trying to build one guy. Like in the contender series, like they they always get like one favorable matchup. So if the matchup were great, I would do that no problem. But I want to stay in the UFC very soon, so I do because say I don't think I need time. I think the moment you sign the UFC, you have to be fit to look the champion in the eye. It's not like you get the UFC and start building, but I I do believe I could give me 10, 11 weeks with Colin Hearn. I'm gonna be up there, and how quickly are you gonna be there? And what two, three years? Like it's gonna be a long time for anyone there. So no, I want to sign the UFC after this if I have to. Go contender series, I'll do that. And I've had to find keys words maybe I'll do that, but definitely, definitely, definitely not fighting. Like it would have to go very wrong for me to fight in the three arena at the end of the year. I definitely, definitely don't I wanna fight in the McGregor chart. I know every hour a lot I know every hour so I keep saying that, but who better like who better to do it? Like I just think that I just think it would uh, it would all blow up. I think it would all blow up if I got on the backyard, but uh, now my goal is the UFC very soon. I don't need time for these guys. I don't need time. I'm just looking through the champion, previous champions of the Bantamweight division in Cage Warriors. And in the history of the Bantamweight division, not one champion has won the belt and gone directly to the UFC. They all had to have one fight or they've all had to defend it at least once. Do you think yeah. you're the perfect fighter to break the mold for this? I probably, I was... <laughs> I've been three facing Cage Warriors. I don't think people. I've been three facing this promotion. Look, look at look what's look what's going on. I'm fucking on the big screens. I all the all the all the shows are on. You're celeb. Yeah, you're, uh, yeah. You're Cage side celeb here now. You got two, first. Two, look at that's two weeks in a row. I've had three uh, facing Cage Warriors. Um, I lad. You got look at you got first draw look at Nathan Fletcher last weekend. And there was a lot of talk after his performance, and it was a good performance too, that he might be next in line. What do you think of Nathan Fletcher as a fighter? What did you think of his performance? And, and what would you think of a matchup between yourself and himself? A revenge, it, a revenge matchup, right? Yeah, it was. I'll tell you this, there's a lot of talk about, a lot of talk from Nathan Fletcher about me. Because <laughs> every time he goes on that camera, all he talks about is me. Every time, every interview, all he talks about, every interview. I don't know, I just keep, every time I hear him, he just seems so bitter. He just seems so bitter that I, I don't know who's chasing who. Like, I, I don't, I'm not looking backwards. And this team, they're all going to say, Austria is a winner. We, I, you're talking about amateur MMA. Like, you're talking about three threes. Like, have that win if you want that. I want to go to the UFC. If it had to be that, it had to be that. Good, good performance. Like, but again, you have to look at the competition. Like, people talk, people are making out this fucking damn way. was a good grappler. Shit. Shit. Okay, Caelan, just before we wrap up, uh you mentioned there three three fights only in Cage Warriors. And look, you've been you called yourself delusional earlier on. I don't think it's delusion. Um and I think you have been turning people into believers slowly. And even I did like I I wasn't I didn't know how it was gonna go when you got to Cage Warriors and you've been you've turned me into one anyway. Uh does it feel good to be proving people wrong continuously? Because you had a lot of people talking shit for I uh... Um, I don't know. Like, do I strike you the type of guy who cares what people think about me? Like, I it's never not really. It never, it never really got it. The only thing is, I said, it used to be like, you used to think I was like a avoiding people and like not a real fighter. That used to maybe get me, but I, I don't think you're what? a fighter that cares what other people think. But I think you might be a fighter who likes to say, "I told you so." Aye. What now? Like what now? What now? I'd say, what are you saying now? <laughs> Caelan we won't keep you any longer we do appreciate the time look we can talk a little bit more about the future and stuff this is definitely not the last time we're going to be speaking with you that's for sure we wish you all the best heading over there to Rome uh, you know getting the job done uh, it would be a great great achievement for you and after years of dedication and hard work I'm sure yourself and the boys will be running the muck in Rome after the after the card one way or another any major plans are you sticking around Rome for long are you going to actually I'm alive I'm staying to the Tuesday, I think there's 60 people coming over. It's a good old crowd, like it's a good crowd for because you're halfway across Europe. Uh, I spent three long months off the pints, it'll be <laughs> looking forward to a few three a few long months on the pints after, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Aye, until I get a fight. 
<laughs> Anyone who's tuning in to Cage Warriors 153, you can catch the action on UFC Fight Pass. Anyone that's going to tune in, Caelan, tell them what they're going to see when you get in there to take on Dylan Hazan for the vacant bantamweight Cage Warriors world title. Uh, a good fight, absolutely. Europe's two of Europe's best, 9-0 against 8-0. Probably as high level M of MMA fight to get in Cage Warriors, period. Uh he, I don't see anyone in the division stopping him. He is definitely high level. I'm one of the best bantamweights in the world inside the UFC, outside the UFC, uh, and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a very big name in European and world MMA very, very soon. So, tune in if you want. <laughs> tune in if you want. I recommend everybody tunes in. UFC Fight Pass next Saturday. May or well, it'll be Saturday week, I guess. You have the Dublin card first, then we have the Rome card, which is going to be taken on uh, on May 6th. UFC fight pass, Kalen Lochran versus Dylan Hazan. Thanks for joining us on the Owl Triangle. Your first, I think it's the lads, I think it's the first return guest on the, the Owl first Triangle ever. As well. The first ever. Will Flurry didn't count because he wasn't on the main, uh, the main, yeah, podcast, he wasn't on the main uh, podcast. So you're the first return Lochran number guest. one. You're creating history, Kalen, creating history every day by day, my man. We wish Another you the show. best. I- yeah. Actually, do you have any? Do you have any of the uh, the the? the geez, I can't speak. The guy jerseys for sale. I do. I'm I am out of large, but I'm re- I'm, I'm, I get them right. Re- uh, how, how can people? How can people buy them? Hit me up on Instagram. I just say a oh, PayPal job. You know, quite handy. They're so, selling well. Selling well. They're a nice jersey. In fairness to you, yeah, no, they are I, nice. Uh, ben Burn Construction. Thank. They sorted the whole thing. Thank God. Nice. Like. <laughs> I think what well, we're all size medium anyway, lads, are we? Yeah, so can, we can get them sent out in the post there, but it's all good. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. 55 pounds plus. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, legend thanks so much Kaelin we won't no uh, we won't keep you any longer we appreciate it wish you all the best appreciate it in your thanks title very fight much. man all the best all the best luck 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 lovely always great to hear from Kaelin we wish him the best he can become Ireland's latest world champion new world champion I guess you know if Reese McKee gets it done he'll probably be the latest unified world champion but you know what I mean you know what I'm saying he's, a, he's already the champ he's already yeah the he's champion. already there he's already there Kaelin can become the newest Irish champion let's talk about a little bit of housekeeping before we finish up we're definitely going to hit the record for the longest Owl Triangle episode this one lads but it's a big episode there is lots to talk about so why not why not um, just before we take off Check out all of Andy, Andy Stevens's interviews ahead of Cage Warriors 153. They did a phenomenal job talking to everybody there. You can catch them on severemma.com. There's a playlist there with all of the fighters down on it. You can listen to all the interviews, get hyped for the fights. Good job on that, Andy. Um, let's Andy, talk some. Andy, Ian's, Andy Ian's and Sean's and, and, and everyone, ah, yeah, not Ian's just me. Sean. Yeah, yeah, everyone did a great job there, but you're you're doing the Trojan work. You've talked to probably three quarters of the card yourself, so credit to you, my man. Um, let's talk D. Begley Quilcha, who uh, stepped in there. We found, you know, it's kind of like the Da Vinci Code here now, trying to crack in and watch some of these combat global fights here, uh, pre tape fights, non broadcast fights. Stream. Yeah, yeah, we need we need on Cheryl to to kind of head on over there and record some of these fights for us. Uh, but Dee Begley was in there. She picked up a fantastic win um, uh, in her latest cage uh, combat J fight. Um, got back into the will col- column and it was great to see and a good win against a tough opponent as well. Yeah, former tough uh, competitor as well in Hanagai, wasn't it? So That's right. To mass- you know, big win, especially to get finished in the first round like that. She was in and out as quick as you like. So what? Uh, Less than two minutes in the cage, guillotine in and out, get your money, happy days, enjoy Miami. I love it. El Mimo Ami Ami, that's right. Um, she, I found it funny, Andy, the commentary team were kind of alluding to the fact like it was going to be a kind of a a, a tactical, stylistic mm. matchup. They were kind of labeling got the kickboxer D. here. Yeah, D is the kickboxer and the next thing she goes in, Hannah, Hannah Guy goes in for the first takedown and D wraps her up in a good guillotine like that. I think I really liked seeing that from D showing her well-roundedness because 
you can easily grab yourself into that position, get into that guillotine choke position, think that you have it, drop the guard, and it can cost you. It's one of the most common mistakes that you see in mixed martial arts. Graham days. used to, would always give it with Franz Malambo. Franz Malambo, that's right. Never drop to a guillotine unless you're fully sure that you have it. But she was sure that she had it. She dropped down into, into guard position. She got her shoulders scrunched up. That's what a, a common misconception when you have the arm in guillotine as well that you feel that you want to lean back it, away from it, but you actually want to real uh, kind of scrunch your shoulders to the forward uh, position, kind of get the extra pressure on her neck. She got the tap. That was a great win for Dee Begley. Mm. And uh, like she said to me, she took all, look at, she had the same experience as Nadine. The fight wasn't live, broadcast live. Just, just, she struggled to get kind of proper confirmation on whether it would be. She managed to get the video footage and she kind of said to me jokingly, fingers crossed that we'll be able to get a live, uh, watch her fight live <laughs> next time. So it's great for her to get the win, get back into the win column. And, uh, you know, she, she's proven a, a tough and difficult test for a lot of the women in the one. Good fight IQ. Yeah. Good fight very, IQ. Because like, it looked like good. she was kind of like just, you know, kind of using it as a threat to defend the takedown almost. And then it was like, oh, hang on, this is... This might be on here, and then the the isn't that the the, the signature John Kavanaugh uh, submission is his favorite one as a, a guillotine. So he uh, he clearly taught her well. Absolutely, uh, Quilce Narius Bartoska Dom Narcus, uh, or not Dom Narcus. I always get those two guys mixed up. Excuse me, Narius Bartoska. He is the guy who had the viral. Uh, head kick finish, just about a head kick finished. Was uh, it illegal? Kick. Was it not? Uh, I think it was. I think we, we will never know. He was back in action over in Thailand. He set up shop over there. I've seen him training with Peter Yan. He got back into the wing column at the weekend as well in the amateur ranks. Or was it an amateur? Or was it professional? No, professional. Professional debut. Professional. 63 kg debut. about, yeah. Uh, he was up against tough fight too, up against the 3 0 opponent in a Filipino lad called, excuse me now, uh, Elias Duran. So, co main event, big opportunity for him in his debut. Like, you know, a lot of pressure, tough opponent. Um, but yeah, he. Um, Trainer, he's training a Tiger Muay Thai now, so uh, under the he seems to be under the wing of uh, is it Johnny Johnny Hutchinson? That's yeah, right, kind John of un, Boy, John Boy Boxing the, under his w- wing now, and uh, yeah, he look he looked good. I've only seen like little clips. I've not seen the full fight, just little clips of it. Um, but it looked like he was put into some, you know, positions that he he learned from. He's on the on his back for a little bit of it, and then I saw the the finish as well. Um, it escapes me now what the finish was. It's an armbar. There you go. So, um, massive win for him. Fight, fighting in a ring as well. I don't like that. The, yeah. the ropes, it just, there's something about it I don't like. Uh, you, you don't learn cage control doing that crack. You don't get experience with cage control when there's ropes around you. But, uh, sure look. <laughs> sure look, these things happen in ringed action in mixed martial arts. Pyle Han is going to be back in the Combat J Global Cage. He is taking on Moses Diaz on May 13th. So a good test, Moses Diaz, who has coming off a, a, a good decision win, but made his Combate Global debut with a six-second KO. It's a tough test for Pa. Looking forward to seeing him back in there. He's in Miami. I'm hoping to talk to him before that fight. We'll try and make that happen. Um, but we've also, Andy, had a bunch of fights announced for the PFL European Series as well in quick succession. Uh, John Mitchell, um, Dylan Took. Um, who else? Franz Malambo. All Franz have been Malambo, announced. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, G- yeah, share yeah. share as your I... quick thoughts on that. As you scramble yeah, to uh, get ready. As I, scr- as I scramble, like, oh, geez, I forgot they were announced. Yeah, well, hmm. Dylan Tuke's taken on. Uh, he's got a serious matchup. He's um, great to see Dylan making a, his PFL debut up a weight, right? Because he was had been at 145, so he obviously he's moving up to fit 155 and taking on a guy. I looked up his opponent, Connor Hughes. I feel like this guy might be going under the radar in the UK scene a bit, but if you go and watch this guy's fights, he looks like a serious operator. Um, I believe he's training out of, out of is it the the Matt, Matt Academy or uh, might have got that wrong in Liverpool, um, but he, he looks a, a serious prospect undefeated at something like 7-0, and oh, so uh, that's a great matchup and I think uh, you know a really good opportunity for, for Dylan to make a statement by taking out an undefeated prospect coming out of, the, of Liverpool in his debut there for PFL. John Mitchell as well, um, taking on a guy that whose name escapes me, French. Guy, guy, guy Sam Derouche. Yeah, guys and Dariush. Um, so yeah, great to see. You know, John's obviously been fighting out in India and places. So uh, if it would be very interesting 
very very interesting to see if they both win um will they be facing each other so because the way the pfl is working is they say it's like a regular season but really the regular season is just one fight it's a tournament it's a, it's an eight-man tournament uh over yeah, three events I, I, it's the same with the US one with Will Fury is like they know who they're fighting first but then it's kind of like for lack of a better way to explain it it's kind of like the PFL make it up as they go along then yeah. based off results so uh, I was very interested to see Franz Malambo and Dominic Wooding being yeah. matched up again that's a rematch obviously Franz was in there with them before and, and got the win as well um I'm really excited to see Franz there. You know, he gave a great, honest interview with me earlier on this year about some of the struggles that he's had to face uh, coming off a very successful year in 2021 into the most difficult uh, year, pretty much the most difficult year of his career so far uh, in 2022 where he couldn't get a fight and and other things were happening outside of uh, competing as well. But definitely check that out if you haven't already. But it's great to see him back in here again, Quilsha. And, I mean, it's a striker's dream, really, having these two guys matched up again uh, with Don Mudding and Franz Malambo set to throw down. I cannot see this one hitting the mat. And I guarantee now that I say it, someone's going to end up getting, getting a submission <laughs> out of it. But, um, wow, uh, what a fight. I loved it the first time. And I can't wait for it a second time. I didn't think we'd be... Uh, we get something like this but uh, fair play to PFL they've put on an absolute cracker here uh, all the potential and probably is going to be fight of the night um, really high level matchup both lads could could end up winning it's, it's part of a tournament isn't it yeah both lads could end yeah. up winning mm-hmm. Do you know it's delighted that he's got an opportunity PFL now and a potential to make a, a lot of money out of it after his uh, a bit of spell on the sidelines 100 percent what last but not least andy i'll send it over to you obviously henry Felipe was in action at ksw81 against martian uh krakowiak <laughs> sorry sean krakow- Denny. krakowiak uh, i think or something like that. Krakow- krakowiak um, we're, um, we're making it up as we go along here yeah you got you got to look at that fight um look at it was a close fight um, you weren't too upset about the decision. It was unanimous uh, for Martian in this. Share your thoughts on that fight before we wrap it up. Yeah, it was very like it was very close. One, I'd, I'd actually love to. I must get on to Henry and ask him. The, the the canvas just looked insanely slippy or something for this one because it seemed that any time either of them went to throw a strike, their feet just went from under them and they were kind of gliding into each other and ended up a lot of like scrambles up against the cage. Um, Henry looked really, really relaxed in the first round. He was almost kind of like MVP esque in his uh, the way he was kind of approaching the exchanges on the feet, <laughs> like uh, throwing a few shapes here and there. Uh, it looked looked really good, but um, yeah, I think that the right guy probably won. I thought it was probably one all going into the last one, and then Henry started really, really well at the start of the third uh, the third round, landed some really nice shots on the feet. It looked as if his opponent had been wilting, but then he got taken down uh, and and his opponent spent about three three or four minutes probably on top um, and, and he was landing shots here and there. So I, I do think he probably won that third round as a result. And yeah, look, a, a close fight. And um, yeah, I don't know. And I, I don't want to like just dismiss it because of the map, but like, I just, it just looked very bizarre. It just looked like they had no footing whatsoever when they were in there. Yeah, that's always a difficult circumstance to have to deal with in there. We've seen it maybe with the humidity or stuff like that. It's hard to know or the sweat and stuff. But yeah, that's unfortunate for Henry. He falls to one and one so far in his KSW tenure. It'd be great to see Henry getting onto that Coliseum card later on this year. It'd be nice to have a bit of Irish interest in that, uh, that huge card. Um, and that's it, I guess, lads. Unless there's anything, what, Andy there's always one has other bit of, what, Yeah, no, one other bit of news was uh, Richie Smullen um, is is fighting again uh, in yeah. Chicago. So I know we'd said, I think we'd said last time about Carl Moore um, that his fight had been postponed because so, so, he was supposed to be fighting in Hawaii. Now he's fighting in Chicago. Richie Smullen will join him on that card and he's got a tough matchup against undefeated 12-0 and Timur uh, Kizriev, who is ranked. So Smullen getting that ranked opponent, which we were saying, you know, he got a, t- a tough matchup last time out against an unranked opponent. He's getting his just rewards here um, by, by taking on uh, someone in the ranking. So a great opportunity for him and an opportunity to, to take his O from him as well. 100%. And that wraps us up for episode 30, a two hour and 30 minute whopper episode. And why not, lads? Fuck it. Why not? Cage Warriors, 153 in just a couple of days time. Hopefully this podcast has got you well oiled up for that. If you're going there, enjoy it. If you're watching it, enjoying it. 
Check out Severe MMA for all the action, all the reaction. The lads will be breaking it down on the big podcast. We'll be back for episode 31 in a couple of weeks to discuss that, that card and Caelan Lochran's card. Maybe even a little bit sooner. May have to do a bit of negotiations as well. Can't be sitting on all that action for all that length of time. But that wraps us up. I'm looking forward to the Cage Warriors card. I know the lads are as well. Thank you so much for listening in. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Give us a five-star rating on Spotify. Give us a like and a follow on SoundCloud. All of that really helps us out. Uh, Head on over to the Severe MMA Patreon account for some more content there as well. But for now, that is it. That is the Owl Triangle. We'll be back with a full Cage Warriors Dublin review and our next episode with a couple of guests as well. Quilcha, see us out, my friend. Garmila Mahakwiv, Fagis Longafall.